Hello, and welcome to the Charlie Paparelli Show. I'm Charlie Paparelli. I've been investing as an angel investor for over 30 years. And during that time, I have met lots of entrepreneurs that have taught me how to build companies from scratch and also grow them into very valuable properties. And to be a successful entrepreneur, you need to be a great leader and you need to be authentic. And that's what we're going to be talking about today with my guest, Joel Neeb. He also goes among his fighter jet friends as Thor, okay? Now, for those of you who would like to be sure that you don't miss one of these episodes, please go to paparelli.com and sign up by just simply giving your email. You submit your email and you'll be reminded of these Friday interviews, but you'll also get, as a bonus, my Tuesday blog. So I look forward to working with you. My guest today is Joel Thor Neeb. He is the CEO of Afterburner, a consulting firm of elite pilots and special ops veterans. They help corporate leadership teams execute better through what they call their flawless execution methodology. Afterburner serves tech leaders, but also some of the top 50 corporations in America. In fact, 85% of the top corporations of America uh, are on their website. Although not a founder, Thor became the president of Afterburner after only being with Afterburner for two years. Thor is a graduate of the Air Force Academy. He's got an MBA from the University of Texas. He is a former elite fighter pilot and trainer of fighter pilots and instructors. He chose to leave the military five years before his pension was going to kick in. This happened because he saw that there was more to do and more people to serve. Today, we're going to find out the details on why Thor, or Joel, made this decision for himself and for his family. Finally, Joel is the author of this book, Survivor's Obligation, and uh, its subtitle is Navigating an Intentional Life. Today's topic a fighter pilot once grounded, but now flying higher and faster than ever. Welcome, Thor, and thanks for sharing your experience with me and also with my audience. Thank you, Charlie. Great to connect and excited to have this conversation. Yeah. Why don't you do this? Uh, step aside for just a second and explain what that background is behind you. Yeah. So that background is actually me. And this is back in the good old days. This is about 10, 11 years ago. And I'm flying upside down in the picture. I'm probably about 50,000 feet above the earth going around four or 500 miles an hour. And uh, I got a snapshot of me upside down uh, during that time frame, feeling on top of the world and uh, <laughs> in my previous chapter. What do you, what plane, do you, what, what uh, aircraft were you in at that time, do you think? Was that a T-38? F-15. Oh, that's this, an F-15. This one was an F-15, yep. Okay. I noticed that uh, in one, in your book that, you know, you have friends that flew F-22s. Did you ever fly F-22s? I never got to. And, you, you know, they don't even have a two seat variant. It's one of the few planes where they, you can't hmm. go get a ride in it effectively. There's only one seat uh, for all of them. So the very first time you fly an F-22, you're all by yourself as opposed to like I flew the F-15, there are two seat variants of it. And so the very first time I flew an F-15, I had somebody in the back seat coaching me along and, and giving me advice, but they don't have that for the Raptor. Yeah, that's because for the Raptor, you probably don't even need a pilot, right? You know, <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, it's like a, it's I would think that a little seat, it's just a fly button. You just get in the plane and you push a button and then you sit back and you check your emails. Do you really do that? You hit fly? <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's, it's pretty close. Honestly, at this point, it's uh, it, it's the flying part is the easiest of everything that you're doing. That's for sure. Yeah, it is interesting that I do. Uh, my daughter once, uh, one of my daughters, they actually uh, dated a fighter pilot. And he, he started flying for one of the airlines and just bored silly. Right. You know, just couldn't take it anymore. You know, he just and he couldn't believe, you know, here he was when he was the junior guy, how poor some of the pilots were, you know, on their rotations. I remember him saying, you know, on some of their rotations, sort of takeoffs and things like that, that the level of training, you know, that they had compared to the level of training that he had as an F-16 pilot were quite a bit different. Night and day. Yeah. It, it's, it's a little alarming sometimes. We actually had some students come through our training program that were already 
airline pilots, I shouldn't even tell the story, but <laughs> on the, on the, <laughs> but the little planes, right. You know, you think about the little plane that'll take you like from, from Memphis to, to Biloxi, Mississippi or something. Yeah. Yeah. Right. A short hop and they were pilots and doing this already. They go into our program and then we'd have to teach them how to fly upside down and, and deformation and, and all sorts of other types of flying. And I remember two in particular that washed out of the program that could not do it. And, the, and these are actual pilots who are already flying people around at that point. So the training is very, very different. Yeah. Well, the circumstances are very, very different that you're putting them in too, you know, as they, uh, mm -hmm. you know, battle and just flying from Biloxi to Memphis is a, is a big difference. Exactly. For sure. So tell me, why don't we start with a little bit um, about Afterburner? Mm -hmm. You know, we'll start there and we'll kind of go through a little bit of your life and then maybe we'll get into that story that you'd cover in, in Survivor's Obligation and, uh, and we'll finish up with the career that you're on right now. How's that sound? That, that'd be great. Okay. So the company I'm with today, uh, it was started 25 years ago, and it was founded by a gentleman who's still the chairman of the company, still a part of uh, the Afterburner team. And uh, his name is Jim Murphy. Jim Murphy was a baseball player and he played at Kentucky. He's, uh, you know, self self anointed, uh, not an A student, let's put it that way. He would say that he's not the, wouldn't be the smartest one in school. And he was really banking on using baseball as his future. And he was going to get picked up in the majors. He was one of the top players and one of the top ranked teams in the country. And then um, life stepped in and he got an injury in his senior year, the same year that all of his friends got picked up to go to the majors. All of a sudden now he, yeah. he didn't because he wasn't eligible. And so he had to figure out what he's going to do next. He got pulled into this opportunity to be a fighter pilot. And uh, and he thought, wow, what a great transition. Wait, 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 wait. How do you go from a baseball player that has a knee injury or an arm injury or something into being a fighter pilot? He got pulled into. What does that mean? So it, fortunately, he had some good people looking out for him because he's he's a great leader and mm -hmm. he's he did so well at baseball. And he was one of the captains on the team, just really well regarded. And so when it looked like he was not going to have a follow on career and you needed something to fall back on. Uh, people said, let me make an introduction for you. We, we know some individuals who are uh, part of a guard unit down in Georgia mm. where they're flying F-15s and uh, you can get hired by them and they'll send you to pilot training. You can come back and stay in Georgia, fly in the guard and uh, do that as long as you like. Wow. Can you still yeah. do that? So you definitely can. They don't have that same unit open in Georgia anymore, but yeah. there's one in Florida that flies F-15s. There's one in Oregon and a couple other places in, in Boston. So absolutely. So you don't have to go to the Air Force Academy to become a fighter pilot. Exactly. It was, it was a secret I wish they would have told me back then because I went through four grueling years at the Air Force Academy in order to get my pilot slot. Well, I want to learn more about that. But tell us, but but also on Afterburn, I, th I, I was struck by this, this uh, methodology that uh, your founder, Murphy, put together, you know, called Flawless Execution. Right. Is that what it's called? That's what it's called. That's yeah, the name so what, of it. Tell me a little bit about that and how it uh, and how it helps how helps your clients. So effectively, where this came from is Murph. What his call signs Murph. He had an epiphany that most of us had as well when we became fighter pilots. At some point in time, we look around and we say, "How did this happen to me?" In other words, he's flying faster than the speed of sound with seven of his closest friends just a few feet away from each other in a $50 million machine. All of his friends are in the same level of uh, expense to the, to the taxpayer. And he's doing these amazing things. And he's 23 years old. And he's saying, how did this happen? I wasn't doing this six months ago. I was driving a car six months ago. And now I have these amazing capabilities on the top 1% of pilots mm -hmm. in the world. What just happened to me? And he realized that there was a system that took principles to transform him and spit him out, not only as an amazing individual contributor, but as an elite team member that could take on anything in the world. And I remember having the same feeling when I, when I was a fighter pilot, I would look around the room and just sit in awe and think what amazing people that I'm surrounded by, what an amazing system that taps into and leverages all of the great insights and, and, and abilities of this group. We're hyper competitive because we're all competing for the next assignment and the next slot. And we're, we're all trying to go to Top Gun. You know, it's a real thing. Um, but at the same time, we're also investing in one another as much as possible. If I learn something, a new tactic that uh, that's making me successful, you better believe I'm going to go share that with all the other team members at the same time. Really unique culture. And, and Murph said, you know, if we could bottle this. That's interesting, can, though, you know, because yeah. you watch that Tom Cruise Top Gun thing, you know, and he wasn't going to share anything with anybody, you know. That, right. But that's not the culture. 
It's not the culture at all. And, yeah. and actually, I think that's why that's a pretty good movie from the perspective of his journey, his arc in the movie is yeah. to go from the maverick, uh, you know, alone and unafraid to then become the guy who believes in a wingman and believes in a team. And that's that's ultimately what it's all about. We, we enter, you know, you take a lot of type A personalities, put them into fighter pilot training. At some point, every one of them breaks and every one of them realizes that left to their own devices, they're not going to make it. And it is going to require the team to get them through. Is that true also the special forces guys? They're in the same situation, aren't they? One hundred percent. Working with special forces too, aren't you? Navy SEALs and and uh, the elite the elite army units and things. Exactly. And, yeah. and one of my good friends is he told me a story that illustrates this best. He's a Navy SEAL, but he also trained in BUDS, which is the Navy SEAL Development Program, mm -hmm. right? And he said that you know we've seen every flavor of elite athlete. He said professional athletes. We've had professional football players go through their program, professional baseball, um, every elite athlete you can imagine. And so they're not impressed with that. He even went so far as to say, we're not watching you when you're succeeding because you wouldn't get here unless you're capable of succeeding at, at the things we're going to put in front of you. He said, the only time we're paying attention to you is when you start to fail, because that's what defines whether or not you're the type of person that can become a SEAL. Do you take on that failure and iterate and make changes and, and rely on a team to lift you up? Or does that failure destroy you because you don't have a growth mindset? You can't see a way past this. And for the first time in your life, you didn't succeed and you can't see how to get past this barrier. And that, that's really the defining characteristic. They had elite capabilities about, in, you know, in abundance. What they didn't have is that growth mindset and that grit and that perseverance to work through the failures. So it's really this wonderful body that God has given them and these these gifts of coordination and all that, but then it becomes mind over that body, right? I mean, that sounds what it seems like. Exactly. And I would even go so far to say that the real gift that God gave them at the end of the day and that God gives all of us beyond our bodies is, you know, because I I would take somebody with perseverance over natural abilities any day. Um, the natural abilities really play very little into the potential of these team members, whether it's a SEAL, a fighter pilot, or in business. Um, you know, I don't care how great a natural public speaker you are, natural leader you are. Mm -hmm. I, I'm much more interested in the person who has a growth mindset and uses um, their gifts to move forward and, and grow. All right. This is, you're getting me a little off the topic here, which was I was talking about your methodology, but this growth mindset, you talk about persistence, and then you use the word growth, that concept of growth mindset. What does that mean to you? For me, that means a reliance on consistency over intensity. And that means that, you know, and, and this is the opposite of what the world values, right? The world values that short burst of energy, that big moment. What's that transformative thing that occurred to you? And you, you might be able to pinpoint some transformative moments in your life. I certainly have a few that we can talk about here, but they're really the result of the consistency leading up to it. The reason you're able to take advantage of that moment is because of the consistency that got you there. That's what the methodology taps into as well. How do you consistently iterate to improve every single day with your team as an individual? How are you doing that towards a clear destination that's compelling and aspirational and that you're excited about and, and, and use that to back into the three or four things you should do today? So that's really the methodology at its heart to help teams, individuals, organizations to map out an amazing future in exquisite detail back into what are the few things we've got to do to start going in that direction and then hold them accountable to the execution to go after it. What do you, what would you say are the principles that are the foundation of that methodology? Because you say they so, came from Murphy, came, came from Murphy, Murphy's training. He looked back and said, six months ago, I couldn't drive a car right now. Here I am flying a $50 million airplane, right? How did, uh, so what are those principles that, that ba make, make for the foundation for this methodology as you go, as, as you, that you guys teach? Yeah, a, a couple of really important foundational things. Mm -hmm. The first thing, and this is the core to the methodology, is that every time we go execute a mission, we do four things. We plan it, which, which means we get the group together in an inclusive fashion. We you know, take a diverse team of different pro problem solving skills. We have a common mental model to approach that problem. We all leverage the insights of the entire group, put our fingerprints on the plan, earn our buy into it. So that's a planning stage. We brief it, which is often skipped by uh, corporate America, and brief serves as the distinction between 
the collaborative portion of planning where I do want to hear your insights to we're going to start the execution now. So I really don't want to hear any more inputs from this point forward. And it's important to do that with our team members and, and tell them that there's a time where I want a ton of feedback and a time where I don't any longer. We just have to start executing. Corporate America likes to get into analysis paralysis where they'll just continue admiring the problem for long periods of time. And so the briefing serves as that point to say, like a huddle in football, everybody sh understand what you're going to do, what you're going to be held accountable for, ready, break, and then we start executing. So During execution. Briefing, so what happens in a briefing, pre-flight briefing, you know, like if you got four or five of you guys are going to take off in fighter jets, right, to a particular talk, what's that briefing entail so that maybe I can apply it maybe to, and, and then apply it to business there a little bit? Because briefing is an odd, that's an odd word to say there's planning and there's briefing. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to make, make sure we're all clear on it. So I flew 2,500 missions, 2,500 times I conduct a mission brief uh, okay. prior to it. And what that entails is we take the collaborative, and I'm going to call it chaos of planning, because it's yeah. a bit chaotic. If, if we're doing it right, we're coming up with all these innovative ideas. We're thinking outside the box and we're putting all our fingerprints on the plan. And ultimately, we come up with a plan. But through that chaos of planning, we have to translate that into action. And the briefing serves to do that. So when we get together in a briefing, it's no longer everyone having a speaking part, only the leaders talking. And the leader is going to put the mission objective on the board. And, you know, in, in my old days, that was, uh, you know, defend the target or, you know, take out these aircraft, whatever, whatever I had to do for my mission objective. When I'm doing this with a company now, it's create $100 million worth of pipeline within the next 60 but you're days. you're clear on the beginning in the briefing what the One. What success equals, right? You know, exactly. Right. The entire time while I'm talking, Charlie, it's above my head. I mean, there's no way the group doesn't know what success equates to. Okay. And that's really important because all too often in the corporate world, we, we want our teams to try hard and do well. And maybe we have some, <laughs> right. some you know, annual goals, but we don't, we don't lay it out for the team exactly what success looks like this quarter or even half of the quarter, what six to eight weeks, what does success look like? And so we, we have that objective on the board where everyone can see it. Okay. And then we talk about what we're going to do each step mm -hmm. along the way. So in a mission brief, I'll say, here's the chronological order of events of things that are going to take place. And we get through the entire order of that. If it's a corporate briefing, we're going to talk about how for that pipeline mission, we're going to you know, make a list of the top 20 customers we're going to go after. We're going to create a template for uh, success in creating pipeline. We're going to bring in the old team that was super successful last quarter. We're going to get insights from them. I'm making all this up, but you can you can imagine how that that plan comes together with a clear course of action. Yeah, but then and so we're bringing it. Then you're actually what's pointing that? at people, right? 100%. And we're you're bringing it front of mind. You're going to do that, right? <laughs> Exactly right. And you can imagine in, in these environments, a lot of times these teams will plan things and they'll come up with good ideas. But these groups are pretty used to talking about doing stuff. And then, it, you know, some of it happens, some of it doesn't. We're making it very clear to the group that we what we planned yesterday, we're actually going to turn into action. So, you know, Bill, here's what you're going to be responsible for. And that's going to happen on November 15th. Make sure that you get that done. And we're just we're creating clear roles and responsibilities before execution starts. Wow. Okay. So I got planning. I got, I get plan brief. What's third. Next one's execute. And of course okay. that's what everyone does, but the key to execution is to execute with agility. And the only way you can execute with agility and be able to navigate the inevitable pop-up threat is if you do a few things. One, you start off aligned. So in other words, the only way you're going to stand any chance of success during execution is if that briefing sets them up in the right way. There's clear roles and responsibilities. And so everybody's looking in the same direction, has an understanding of what the path looks like. If we're all staring in the same direction, like a flock of birds, when a hawk enters a flock of birds and you see that disperse, it looks like a one living organism, right? They all move in unison. Well, yeah. the only reason they do that is because they started in the same direction and they are all able to see that same thread at the same time. And so as a group, they have the exact same response around it. Same thing happens when we have a team that's flying in unison towards that target, that $100 million goal with clear uh, uh, course of action along the way. When the, when the inevitable pop-up threat emerges, as a group, we can navigate around it. Okay, so that's the execute, and then? And then finally, debrief. And that's probably the most important part to any of these missions. And this is where we give the group their voice back, because remember, I took their voice from them. I, I'm in very intentionally not being collaborative anymore once we enter execution phase. Doesn't mean I don't wanna hear like, you know, there's a massive pop-up threat we need to talk about, but that's gonna happen offline. 
you're going to call me up and say, Hey, I want to let you know, we lost two of our big customers and we have to figure out a way around that's that. Yeah. Of course I want to have that conversation, but I don't want you to reopen planning in the middle of execution and say, you know what I think we should do now and, and, and pontificate. And, and, and that, that happens to often. in a fighter people. pilot mission. That'd be pretty That'd be pretty weird, right? <laughs> exactly. And, 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 in, and in corporations, it's weird as well, because what's really happening is they're, they're kind of trying to do, um, you know, slow down the mission a little bit. And it's not because they're bad people. I was going to say it derails it is what it does. Exactly. Yeah. They're, they're trying to derail it. They're trying to say, and here's what happens. It'll be two weeks into execution and somebody will say in front of the entire group, oh, you know what? I was talking to legal and we got to stop this mission because uh, legal says we can't build this pipeline. Or just, we just don't have the right stuff to put in front of them. The contracts aren't there. And then the whole mission is derailed. Even if you try to talk them back onto it at this point, then you've lost the team's confidence and, and all sorts of things things. And so I'm very intentional about telling those groups, you're not bringing that up in front of everyone. You talk to me one-on-one -on -one right. and we'll, we'll figure happening? out together. We keep falling back into execution. So then yep. get me to this debrief, because one of the things that I notice, and debrief I think is very, very important. And if I'm guilty of anything, it's sort of like, uh, you know, there's, to give a Christian example would be prayer. Like when we really, really need God, we go to God and like, oh, please, God, oh, please, God, do whatever, you know. And how many times have I, has the situation that I was praying about turned out really, really well, okay, or maybe right. not so well, but better than I thought. And I never had that debrief with God. I never, I never circled back around and said, you know, thank you for stepping in. Thank you for what you did. You have the same thing in debriefs in business. You know, we don't have a debrief. It's sort of like, oh, the project's over and we all, you know, have a beer and leave. You know, exactly. and that's the debrief. You know, we never get better. So how does the debrief work? So the debrief is the most important part of what we do. And, and I brought it up in the context of execution because you got to remember there's a tension in execution because I'm not letting them have yeah. a voice. But I give it back to them in the debrief. And not only, not only do I empower them to speak up in the debrief and tell me what went well, what didn't go well, and let's have a longer conversation around that, I obligate them to talk about that because I want to do this better the next time. One thing I know for sure, there's no such thing as a perfect mission. And it's so really important to get- nobody on the team who's quiet in the room. You're going to point yeah. to them. 100%. And okay. they, better, they better show up prepared with ideas on what went well and what didn't go well. And it has to be material to how we're going to do this better the next time. And so everyone has to put thought into what we want to explore as a group. Doesn't mean they have to know the root and cause you, or have all the answers. How do you capture that so that it does get incorporated next time? As opposed so it, to, we had a really great two-hour meeting, yep. filled the board with ideas. Okay, what we did well, what we didn't. And then we go away again. and. The team's dispersed, right? You know, great question. I mean, we aren't like you talk about in the, in the book. You know, one of your your co-author in the book is Chris Strickland, who was a Thunderbird pilot. Okay, so those guys, they're doing the same thing every day. You know, so yep. yeah. So if I have a debrief, yeah, I'm going to apply it the next day. Okay, <laughs> I don't know that that happens in business, does it? Great question. And that's a comment I get all the time that we're on to the next thing and the next thing is different enough that it doesn't justify yeah, yeah, bringing the lessons go. learned from the previous one. And, and I would challenge that in a massive way. And, and I think if people really look at the fundamentals of what they're doing, then the lessons learned absolutely translate. Okay. And that's what we're missing is that we're not doing a deliberate look backwards. So let's talk about it from the context of this pipeline mission. They have a $100 million pipeline mission. Let's say they're successful and now they want to be able to scale this. Well, they're not going to do another $100 million pipeline mission, but they want to memorialize the lessons, right? Maybe we turn this into onboarding for the next round of sales team members that, that are going to join. So we don't lose this, these lessons learned, and we don't lose this progress. So we figure out why we succeeded at creating $100 million of pipeline, and we teach that in our onboarding training. So you can do it. You can memorialize these lessons a couple of ways. The easiest one you alluded to, we just put it into tomorrow's plan. So if we finish the debrief, we get some great lessons learned. We know how to do things differently the next time. I'm going to bake that into tomorrow's attempt. And we still have more pipeline to build. So, of course, we can, you know, that's an easy one. That's a layup. We can, we can always do that. But then thinking outside of the box, other ways to memorialize it. One is to create standards for your organization, to create checklists 
So when I work with tech organizations, for example, and they need to grow from, I'm thinking about one right now that's at about 500 million. They did four acquisitions last year. They're looking at three more acquisitions this year. They've got a $4 billion valuation right now. And they have investors that are expecting that to go to 10 billion over the yeah. next couple of years. So really successful, but massive growth that they're expected to pursue along the way. What we have to do is they're growing so rapidly. Things are happening so quickly that that they're missing, you know, they're so they're successful, despite the fact that they're not capturing lessons learned. And so we come in and we build structure and sophistication and the ability to memorialize this, put it into tomorrow's onboarding training, put it into the standards and checklists that they're going to use and playbooks use they'll this, use. You use this term onboarding training. That was a new term that you put in there on when we started talking about this debrief and the lessons learned. Tell me about how tell me about the onboarding training so I don't miss that piece, too. Because that the was onboard of the four pieces, okay? <laughs> sure. And, and then the onboarding, if you think about the great resignation that's occurring right now across yeah. all organizations, and we're seeing this massive turnover of employees and you know so many people are leaving and, and, and others are showing up and these fresh faces that are showing up they might bring some habit patterns that are good ones from the previous company but we have to very quickly indoctrinate them mm. into our processes and so onboarding becomes absolutely critical how do i as fast as possible because that, that's always a conversation we'll have an roi unit that they always look for is take my time to productive salesperson from six months down to three months. And they, they, they can quantify how, how many billions of dollars of value that creates uh, when they're able to do that. The like, example, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Good notes. Tech, give an example. I think example is a good thing. So you, you've seen the Thunderbirds or the Blue Angels fly yeah. before, correct? The amazing pilots, right? I mean, it's it's just the most incredible thing to watch. They're, they're, the they're literally- The incredible, yeah. Yeah. Inches away from each other. Right. Uh, and, Is it and truly inches away? Truly. You, if there wasn't a canopy there, you could reach out and you could absolutely touch that other airplane. That's oh fine. God. That close. <laughs> We're going okay. hundreds of miles an hour. And any little mistake they make not only puts their lives in jeopardy, but it puts the lives of the crowd, right? You, that's, that's watching yeah. it. And some, sometimes that crowd is a million people that, that's we've watching. Seen those, we've seen those accidents in like Germany and things and uh, air right. shows. Yes, it just yep. goes blowing into the crowd. Hundreds and killed. So, and so when you think about the level of flying that's required to accomplish this, the precision, and then what's at stake, how often do you think the Thunderbirds or the Blue Angels can afford to lose a team member, to have somebody walk away, take their corporate knowledge, take all their camaraderie, take all of you know, the execution cadence they built up to this point, the repetition? How often do you think they can lose a team member? God, you would want them to stay away around until they retired, okay? That, yep. that would be the thing. It's like no, you're getting better and better at this every, every day, and I trust you more and more as, as the guy that's six inches away from my wing, right? Exactly. Do they lose it? Lose somebody? Every year, half the team leaves. Oh, come on. That's Every crazy. year, half the team walks away with their corporate knowledge, with their experience, with the camaraderie, with their culture, never to return. They'll never have any interaction with them again. And they're replaced by fresh faces who've never done this type of flying before. This is not the type of flying we do in the regular fleet. So and what's the onboard look like? So that's the thing. The onboarding is based off of the standards and the practices of the past and you take all the best practices from everyone that's preceded you and you distill that it's not you know it's not a thousand step checklist you distill it down into the very key components for success and then you combine that that checklist with debriefs that allow you to iterate and get better each time that are very focused on the things you're doing wrong so that by the time the first show occurs you're at the same level of the previous team that performed last year oh my god <laughs> so you have this this life that you've created for yourself, this moving from fighter jets into consulting. You know, it's it's such an interesting life, but maybe we can kind of go back a little bit into sort of childhood. How did how do you build something like this? This is almost like what you said about Murphy, you know, which blew my mind. You said, Oh yeah, he didn't make it, you know, in baseball because of an injury that he had. All his friends got <laughs> drafted. So he he just got pulled in, I think is the term that you use. He got right. pulled in to become a fighter pilot. You know, there's this there's this secret that says, well, how do I ha how did all this happen to you? So, you know, where were where were you born and raised? So I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay. I was born in a blue collar family. Um, my parents 
Got married in uh, 1970. Seven years later, they had me. I was the first uh, born out of the family. Uh-huh. And I've got a younger sister. My parents are still together. They just celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary last year. Was your dad or anything? Was there any military background back then? Not a bit. My grandpa went to West Point, you know, just like all of our the previous generation, the greatest generation, they all served. Um, and yeah. so my grandpa went to West Point. He was actually a pilot at a time when it was really dangerous to be a pilot. And, uh, <laughs> and so he, he did that. But he was what already made passed. It really dangerous then as opposed to really dangerous now or not well, so dangerous now. Sure. The accident rates. And and you and I were talking earlier about F-22s and, you know, how, how safe they are. We made the joke that it's it's kind of, you know, pilot proof, but, but there's a lot of truth to that. Like there's, there's so many redundancies built into the systems today yeah. um, that it, they're just light years safer than the, what they were in the past. And that so many things we relied on a human for that we don't anymore. Yeah. I found that I go to, uh, I did for a while. I don't know that I'm going to go back to it, but I went three times. I went to, uh, uh, you know, I ride motorcycles. So I went to racing school. Yeah. And you realize that like B- they have BMW S1000s there and the technology in there is so advanced that you can't like, if you hit the accelerator in a turn, which will normally spin the back wheel out on a bike, it won't let you do it because it knows your la- your angle of attack. It knows your speed. It knows, it knows almost the track conditions. You know, it's just incredible how much technology is baked into those. So I can't imagine same things in planes. Exactly the same. And, and, you know, one of the most interesting things that I've seen is we've changed in how the instrumentation is displayed. So if you think about, here's, the, here's probably the most interesting technological advance. And I think there's an awesome, super intriguing corollary for business that we can apply. So if you think back to the Wright brothers and they first took off, how many instruments did the Wright brothers have in the plane? Zero, right? Zero. It was a wooden airplane. They're up for like 12 seconds. Then we go to World War One, 11 years later or so, and now we have a little bit more technology in the planes. I think they can probably tell their airspeed um, in a rudimentary way, maybe their altitude, but for the most part, they're just still re- relying on flying and, and their own instinct to be able to do it. World War II, we probably have 20 instruments in the cockpit now. We can tell our fuel. We can tell all the other things that, that we care about. Vietnam War, we could add another 50 instruments. Well, fast forward to when I flew. We had 350 instruments and dials and switches inside of the F-15 cockpit. And F-15 is a fourth generation aircraft. F-22. Does that make it safer or less safe? So that's the that's the conversation I wanted to have. So in the F-22 and F-35, the next version of these planes, if mine had 350, how many do you think that the next version has? The F like F-22? Mm -hmm. I have no idea. They they'll only they had to show, go to less. They just had to go to less. So Charlie, this is what the amazing part is. The not only did they go to less, they'll only show you like five or six instruments at a time. Okay. So we went from 350, almost you know 400 at times, depending on the variant of the aircraft. 350 instruments, cockpits, and, we and just 350 out. instruments on your F-15. They were like 350 inch in front of you. In front of me, like in the Millennium Falcon, where you just have all of these different instruments above you and below you and to your side. Like, you, I mean, anywhere you, you put anything, it landed on an instrument or a switch that did That's something. That's probably where the heads up, dis- the idea for heads up display came. They said, let's put the really important stuff up here, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a massive transition that had to take place. And I think the business world is, is slow to make this transition. I think the business world still cherishes getting more information and they still think there's value in getting more information. Right. And we had to learn the hard way because I didn't have 350 eyeballs. So I had, we had <laughs> to figure out, you know, what are we going to pay attention to? So what I had to do as an instructor is constantly tell my students, look at these three instruments and look at these during this phase of flight and, and, right. and force them to do that. The airplane, the new generation of airplanes learn how to do that for us. And you contrast that with what we do in business. And we're all in the information age and we all have a, you know, a device that could answer any question that we could possibly pose it right within reason. And, and, and so we've never had more information at our fingertips, but it's the, the information age and not necessarily the wisdom age because we're not necessarily using that information to the best of our ability. We're not necessarily putting the right information in front of us because we don't have the systems to accomplish that. And I think businesses are slow to make that transition. They still kind of cherish and hoard all of this information and more is better because it was right. Back in the day, it was great when we got a couple more instruments in the cockpit. In World War II, absolutely, give me another instrument, I need one. But 350 first instrument, I don't need that anymore. And so the real value is in whittling that down into the critical few. 
It is. And it's interesting to that this has come up a couple of times in this conversation about businesses and particularly in larger corporations is you get into more data is better, right? Or there's, right. but, but what that does is it does what we talked about also in execution. If you allow people to kind of constantly revisit the plan, you're always getting into this sort of slow down paralysis, right? And uh, I love that where you talked about, look, we have a plan, we have a briefing on how we're going to execute. We execute and then we debrief. We capture that information. We use it for the onboarding of the next project and new people, right? And then we start all over again. And it's the same thing with data. You know, if I've got a spreadsheet with my key indicators and there's 300 of them, what can I do with that? Yeah. What can exactly. I, what can I do with that? I can't, I can't lead a company that way with three. You know, really, I've got to look at five, like you said. And I could I could handle that. And those five are the most important. And if I get those right, we won't crash and burn. Okay. <laughs> and, and here's what you can do with, you know, 100 pieces of information on an Excel spreadsheet. You can hide behind that. And that's what a lot of corporate America does. Right. And you, you go to a meeting and that you hear from the marketing team and they'll say, we're all green. Everything's going great. You hear from the product team and they'll say, we're all green. We're delivering on time. Everything's going great. You hear from the sales team. They'll talk about how they're doing well. But then you look at the corporate goals and we're not green. So it's not it's not all bubbling up to the top most important things, their instruments in the cockpit that they should be focused on because they can hide behind silo KPIs and things that don't necessarily connect to business success. But, you know, entrepreneurs, which we deal with, I always I once asked an entrepreneur, I said, how do you set your priorities for the day? He said, I said, it's pretty simple. He said, I decide on what what is uh, what can kill me today. And I work on that. OK. Yeah. And I think that that's what pilots do. Right. I mean, pilot is you have to stay alive. You have to stay safe. You have to stay airborne. Right. And I think you're focusing if there are 350 instruments, you are going to pick out if you've got experience, those three or four that uh, are going to keep you safe. Now, if you want to optimize your envelope or something, I'm sure there's other implement, uh, uh, other other instruments that could probably help you. You know, but so it's, to get there to optimize. But man, first thing is, I just need to stay airborne. <laughs> I, yeah, I would have a slight variation to that if I was yeah. consulting with those entrepreneurs. I would say for sure you have to stop those things that are going to kill you. But you're not just managing downside risk. And as a pilot, if I wanted to be as safe as possible, what my answer would be is I wouldn't fly. Right. I mean, it didn't. Flying is inherently dangerous. And so there, it's not that I don't accept risk. I create an acceptable level of risk and mitigate down to that by proper planning, training and preparation with my team. But that's only managing my downside. And what I really want to maximize, especially if I'm, I'm an op entrepreneur, is my upside potential. Mm -hmm. And that's a different approach. And that's a different muscle to flex. It's not just thinking about the things that are going to kill me. It's thinking three years down the road. And you can even do this as an entrepreneur. Plan out what does success look like in exquisite detail. There's a great um, phrase that we often underestimate what we can accomplish in three years, but we overestimate what we can accomplish in three months. So here's what we take away from that. We need to have more conversations about what does success look like in the very long term on the horizon. Use that as our North Star to get all those arrows pointed in the same direction, get us all aligned to the long term plan. And then once we do that, if we have a very clear understanding of where we want to be from a workforce perspective, competitive brand perspective, finance perspective, partnership perspective, then we back into what we need to do today. And if we start with that destination, this aspirational goal, that's the summit of the mountain, well, then we can whittle back from the hundred things we could or should do today, because we can all come up with that. The hundred things we could or should do down to the three things we must do if we're really going to take a step towards that summit. Yeah, there's a little bit of idealism in that, okay? Uh, particularly with startups, you know, I think that there, I, th I think the metaphor that sort of came to mind when you were speaking is startups are really, in, in, in a lot of cases, these are the people that I get. These are, these are pre-formation companies, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't even have a, we don't, even, we haven't registered even with the state yet, okay, at this point, is they are like the Wright brothers, they're just looking to stay aloft for 12 seconds. If we do 12 seconds, we're just going to celebrate because yeah. it's proved that this might work, okay? <laughs> and when I do get to, you know, being a big corporation like some of those Fortune 50s that you're working with, I am in an F-22, okay? Yeah. And I think that what you're saying does make sense, but you have to moderate that sort of 
consult or the advice that you give, depending upon what the resources are and where these people are in the market. You know, when you come, because I start with those, those guys, they have nothing. They, they're not sure what they see. They don't know what's there or what's going to come or where the threats are going to be, you know, so it's hard to do this sort of three year, five year plan kind of a deal. It's really like, well, let's start with a 30 day hit list. Okay. Let's have a 30 day goal plan. And if we hit that, that's great. Then let's try to get to, if we do that three to year months in a row, let's do a 90 day and you kind of move it out from there. But I agree with what you're saying, but startups are unique in that regard. They are the right brothers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they are. But the one thing I would say then okay. is for the Wright brothers, that 12 second flight was the summit and that was the three year journey, probably longer than that. Yeah, and so yeah. even for these startups, you know, it, it doesn't have to be, let's hit a billion dollars. It can be as simple as let's hit 10 million in three years. And, and we have a 30 person team or a 25 person team at that point. But the point is that we're working backwards from a destination that we all agree on and we all get excited about because at the end of the day, that's the fuel that gets us up, not our 30 day plan. It's, you know, the 30 day plan is much less exciting than where we're going in the long term. And the 30 day plan is absolutely necessary. We have to have that vision without action is daydreaming, but action without vision can be a nightmare. And so we have to have both of those components in order to keep the team going, in my opinion. Why is action without vision a nightmare? because we find our teams getting caught in busy work and they feel like they're just on a rat race, this hamster wheel that's going faster and faster and faster. A leader of a billion dollar business unit said to me behind closed doors, he said, Thor, I don't know how I'm going to do this. He said, I, I, I can't do it. I can't push them out the door again for the 10th quarter in a row to give 10% more effort for a 10% higher number. And I said, let's change that. Let's not push them out the door. Let's create a pull mechanism that's so compelling and has their fingerprints on it that they go out and pursue that as a group instead. And the same group that was challenged to hit a 10% year over year goal ended up hitting 40% that year and just crushed all expectations because all of a sudden it was a pull mechanism that was pulling all of them collectively into that direction. Okay. Which, which brought them, that was the planning cycle that they brought them into to make exactly. that certainly happen. That makes sense. All right. So why the Air Force Academy? I mean, you're a nice, you're a nice, you're a Green Bay Packer fan. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Milwaukee Brewers fan, you know, yeah. or the Air Force yeah. Academy, you know, you didn't have anybody that sort of pushed you in that direction. It's not like you had that legacy, if you will, that quote, pulled you along as you were talking about. That's sort of. Not like, at all. It, it, you didn't go to me, military school, did you? In high school? No. no okay. Not a bit. And, and for me, it was, um, it wasn't a dream. You know, it certainly wasn't something that I thought about forever. And that's typically why somebody goes to West Point or the Air Force Academy, because they have a relative that did. And they you know this is a legacy. So for me, I knew very little about um, the academy, but I knew that it had discipline. And to give you a peek into my high school career, I was a great student for the first two years, 4.0, um, did everything that I was supposed to. I was a great student for most of my life up until that point. I was a bookworm. I was, you know, I would be considered a nerd. Um, by most of your listeners. Huh. And I made I made a conscious decision around sophomore, junior year that I wanted to be more social. I wanted to do some of these things that I, I saw the other kids doing. I fell into the same trap that most kids do at that age. And so I started drinking. I started going on partying with these guys and you could watch my grades start to take a dive. And what I learned was that I had the smarts. I had, you know, I had the ability to, to you know, learn these things that I needed to. But I, I had at least the self-awareness that I lacked the discipline to, to take things to the next level. And I, I could have made it through another college, I'm sure. But what did I had some was mentor really, at that time tell you that? If you had my just parents. Little, if you get <laughs> your discipline back, you'd get on the right track again? or Definitely you know, my there parents. There seems to be some yeah. high school teacher that sort of crosses the line and cares about you enough to kind of say something. And it sort of like lives with it. It sits with you for the rest of your life. You remember that moment. Was there a moment like that? Yeah, 100%. There was a high school teacher and there was a guidance counselor uh, okay. that both that both said that I absolutely needed discipline and uh, and that this was a good direction for me. I remember telling that guidance counselor that I made it into both West Point and the Air Force Academy and Duke. So I made it into those three schools, all great wow. schools. And um, and I thought she'd be really excited about Duke. And she said, oh, that's awesome. The, the West Point and the Air Force Academy. And she was just, really? she was just much more probably because that's what I needed. She knew that's that would be the most transformative for me. So how did you choose between the two? Those are, those, are, <laughs> you're going to be a grunt or you're going to be up in the air. I mean, how did, 
How does that I work? I mean, you just said it. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Story to my army brethren and West Point's a great school um, and they have an incredible legacy. But at the end of the day, they, as you go around the Air Force Academy, they have these you know models of these amazing airplanes and devices. And, and there's like astronauts and stuff like that. That And, and then uh, and then the army. It's, what year it's was so this, well by the way? This is uh, 95. When 95. I was, when okay, I go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and what happened when you went to West Point? So in West Point, you know, it's all it's all great leaders. So they got General MacArthur over here and General Patton and and, and they're they're all great Lots of leaders. Cannons all over the all over the campus, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and it's a castle. And it's just seemed antiquated to me. And uh, and and I was a little bit naive too. I know now looking back, it's it's an incredible school and and it does build leaders. And and I would even argue to a certain extent it builds better leadership qualities than the Air Force Academy. There's some ways that the Air Force Academy can can learn from West Point in that regard. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I was, uh, the Air Force I Academy have, was, I have a, I have a friend who is, uh, who, when the Gulf war start Gulf, no, when nine 11 hit. Okay. He, he decided he was just graduating from, I think it was Washington and Lee is where he was graduating from. And he said, I just need to join the Marines. Mm -hmm. And he tried to get into Marine PLC program, the leadership program that they have. And of course, everybody wanted to be in it. So he had to, he had to kill a year to get there. But I said, why'd you do that? He said, well, I wanted to, I wanted to get out there and fight for my country, he says, but I also wanted to prove, you know, that I had the grit and the courage to kind of do it. And the only way to do that is in the infantry to prove yeah. yourself out in a firefight. Okay. That's how I kind of looked at things. Yep. Is that true? I definitely think there's merit to that. And, okay. and the, you know, the corollary for the Air Force is I had to prove my grit by strapping on a $50 million machine by myself, because make no mistake, even in training, there is a massive amount of fear involved in that. And we don't talk about that a lot. And that's not what you see on Top Gun um, when you watch the movies. Yeah. But that's that's really what the progress is about, is just overcoming this primal fear that I'm not supposed to be upside down. And, you know, 50,000 feet above the ground, this is absolutely the opposite of what I should be doing, but I'm going to rely on my system and my training and everything that got me here. What about firefights? What about, you know, air to air combat or, you know, missions where you're actually, you're, you're protecting, you know, you're, you're, you're flying protection or you're actually flying a mission where you're attacking, you know, targets, you know, so I live in a test, very, how does that test your grit and your courage? I would say it, it it, so first of all, I don't have a uh, combat time because there's no planes that would take off against us and fly against us. I do have uh, time defending the say president. Again, there we, was, there's no say that again. You said that so quickly. We have the airplane I flew. The F-15 has 109 kills and zero losses. Never been shot down ever in its 30 no year that. history. Never. And because of that, no planes will go against us. And so we've enjoyed what's called air superiority since the end of the Vietnam War because we have this plane and our training is just so strong. Now, if we if we fought against China, they, they would go against us. There's some countries that would give us a run for our money, but it's certainly not Afghanistan or Iraq. And so in those two places, we were completely unmatched. And so there was, there was not a place for us to you know defend the sky. So from that perspective, I was I never felt challenged. Most of our people on the ground will tell we you- never, In Afghanistan and Iraq, we never had anybody get shot down? No. We didn't have any planes get shot down during that entire time period. Okay. Now, I, I, I say that we had we had planes get shot down from surface air missiles. We had planes that that's crashed. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking that's, about. So there's yeah, still, not, I mean, you go up in the air, you know, over over a battle zone. You're not sitting there going, I know no one's going to come attack me in the air, but you sure got a lot of people shooting at you from the ground. <laughs> But and remember my F-15, I don't have to go by the ground because I'm like on I'm like the movie Top Gun. I only dogfight. I only take on other aircraft. And we're oh, the first okay. line of defense for the major wars. So if a China kicks off or in some of the, you know, the big countries we ever had to go to war against them, the F-15 would be the first four months exclusively. We would just watch them fly. And, and then the F-16s who don't have the luxury of being at 40,000 feet, I, I'm at a point where none of the surface air missiles can hit me. You know, I'm, I'm not even concerned about that. Down at 10,000 feet, our F-16s are dealing with that all day long. So at 16, I thought 16 was just an improvement on the 15. They're different aircraft. It is a totally different aircraft. And many would argue that it is a step backwards. from. Okay. From and what about the yeah. 22 then? 
F-22 is definitely a step forward. It's uh, the premier version of air superiority. And so, whereas I could be at 50,000 feet, the F-15 can be at about 60,000 feet and it just has massive capabilities. They don't, they don't even have, they have, there's, they, they have uh, even more capabilities than we have. Okay. And just to stay on this for just one more question is when you talk about like China or Russia, you know, some of the major powers, you know, they don't have aircraft that could match those aircraft that we have? They do. And, and that's what's kind of getting scary is that countries like China in particular have invested in training that's like the United States and they have a clear vision for what they want to be down the road. And they, they have um, training that utilizes plan, brief, execute, debrief. So what they've done, they're just they're smart about it. They've they've always copied um, what they've seen. The Russians copied the aircraft, but they didn't copy our training and they didn't copy our that's command and control. And it's a really interesting study because in some in some cases, the Russians had better aircraft because they would take our designs and some spy would take our design and give it to them. And, and then they make a, the same similar plane, but they'd also add things onto it because now they can just innovate against it. But what we found when the Iron Curtain fell, another interesting study in, in team dynamics, when the Iron Curtain fell and we said, all right, now we're all friends. Let's see what happens if we would have flown against each other. What we found out was that because the... American military pushed down decision making and empowered that lowest common denominator on the team, the frontline team member, that that newest wingman to make decisions. And they had a methodology for them to learn fast as possible to stay safe. We were light years ahead of the Russians. And, and here's what the Russians would do. The Russians had strict command and control. They would tell you exactly where to turn. There'd be a bottleneck in all of their um, success, or all of their execution oh, that was bad. back at command center. They would say, you turn this way, you go that way. And it, it makes sense at first because they're keeping their young wingmen safe and they're not letting them get in trouble, but they never allow them to make mistakes and, and learn on their own. And so they were just terrible when we took off against them because of that. It's interesting to bring that back to entrepreneurs. Yep. You know, because I always say that if you ever want to see the organization chart of an entrepreneur, it's the entrepreneur and everybody else. That's the yeah. organization chart. And of course, the next stage in growth is you have to get to functional expertise and get that level of leadership in place so that you can then start bring, bring, building out, you know, managers, et cetera. Right. And um, there is that bottleneck. I remember I talked to a guy years ago. Yeah, this is 30 years ago. He was running a large professional services firm, and I and we were we were co-presidents in a large corporation, and I and we were at a president's uh, get together, and I said to him, you know, I'm curious. I I heard you present, and I said I don't understand your organization. He said, well, it's yeah. simple. And he went to a he went to a flip chart because that's what we had back then. There weren't even whiteboards. He put a dot in the middle of the flip chart, and then they drew a circle around it, and he said. That's my organization chart. I'm the dot. And I went, oh, my God. This guy was running a company of 350 people. Wow. And that's how he did it. And I wound up taking over that company three years later. Sure. And I felt like a wall fell on me. Because you would call people and say, well, what's going on in Delaware? I don't know. But nobody knew anything about anything. Nobody had responsibility or authority to do anything. Yeah. It was just a disaster. And so uh, one of the things we have to make sure that we do is that if you really want to grow your company as a startup, as an entrepreneur, you've got to find those people that, that are willing to take on responsibility very quickly and let them run because yeah. they'll make changes when changes need to be made because they're smart people. You know, if they have to wait for you to make a decision and get the completely up to date on what's going on, they, they're, they're doomed to be $400,000 a year, $250,000 a year revenue companies forever. Couldn't agree more. And, yeah. and I think, you know, as you look at this, how this played out with the former Soviet Union, when lives were on the line, they made this mistake and they fell into this trap of having a bottleneck around the, all their command and control because heaven forbid somebody new make a mistake and, and learn on their own. Let's just make sure we minimize our downside risk exposure. And, and, and they, that was probably a good idea when they first started, but they never matured beyond that. They never got to a point where they empowered and, and allowed others to be a part of the decision making process. So lives are on the line and they made those mistakes. That, it surprises me that people think it's going to be any different when livelihood is on the line. 
In other words, we're gonna, we have the exact same susceptibility to fall prey, those same, same types of mindsets. The, the company you just described is a great example of how that exact scenario plays out in business. Yeah. And do you think that, you know, when we talk about the Russians, you're talking about a culture, okay? Also, yeah. when you talk about, I've done some, I've done some work in Uganda, for example, yeah. And there is very much this, uh, you know, when you talk about almost dictatorships, right? There is this sort of command and control kind of model. And it's more, it, it is more of a, if, if you get into a culture where it is run by a dictator, you know, you would think that, you know, that is going to go straight down. That value system or that way of doing business is going to go right down through everybody within the country, which could hold the country completely back. You know, and that's got to be that's that's got to be true in corporations, too. hundred percent. And, and you know, that's why I think what we do at Afterburner is so valuable, Charlie, because it's a common mental model. In other words, the cultures can be different. And we, we work with global companies. We'll work with a company that needs to have alignment with the team in Japan and the team in Denmark and the team in France. But that's the exact same challenge I had when I was a fighter pilot. I needed to create a mission yeah, but plan. How do you overcome those cultures? It's what you do cultures, is, you know. Yep. And what it comes down to is we're not going to because we, we can have debates and maybe power struggles over whose culture we're going to observe unless something else is between us. And that's a common mental model for how we're going to plan, how we're going to execute, how we'll hold each other accountable, how we'll build these aspirational destinations as a group. And, and this unlocks the this this is the. You know, at its heart, it's, this is diversity, right? Every, you know, diversity and inclusion are the, the buzzwords of the day. But diversity is really just different problem solving skills, different cultural backgrounds. And you have that in spades when you're working with a global organization. People think they want diversity because they know that diverse teams are you know, empirically better. And they are. But only if you have an inclusive methodology to tap into those different problem solving skills. Otherwise, it's going to be more friction. Otherwise, the diversity breeds more more challenge and more sand in the gears. Yeah, so that common mental model. That. That's not how we do it, right? Exactly. With that, right, which sort of shuts down all conversation. 100%. Right. So we get to step into that vacuum and be the methodology that allows them to leverage the wisdom of both crowds and, and put that into the plan and hold them accountable to our way of doing things instead of the American way or the British way or whatever, fill in the blank. And that acts as the inclusive uh, piece of it. All right, so now I want to go back to the Air Force Academy. Let's yep. let some air out of the balloon here. You know, you got us kind of buzzing pretty good right now. Is <laughs> does coffee, everybody sorry. that goes to the Air Force Academy they all want to be fighter pilots? I mean, so at the time I went there for sure. Um, that's changed though. That's what that's you wanted really, to be. Yeah. yeah well, if you yes. were this bookworm, bookworm nerd, you know, didn't you want to? Didn't you? Didn't you think I'd be better flying C one thirties? I mean, <laughs> you know, transport. <laughs> supply aircraft or something, you know, I don't understand, you know, somebody has to fly those too. Does everybody, I always wondered about that with uh, the Air Force Academy. And and that's an incredible job as well. And, and you know, that, 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 that it pulled other types of um, personalities into it. So I would say for me as a bookworm, the way I'd really describe me in high school is I just didn't have that many friends in my first two years of high school. So I still sought adventure. You know, I wasn't, it wasn't that I loved reading and loved being in the books. I just didn't have a social group, a social network that uh, I was really connecting with. And so as I matured, I said, I want to really invest in this and, and learn how to build, build this uh, network of friends. So from that perspective, I was a nerd, but yeah, I still want to be a fighter pilot. I still wanted to have all those, that hero's journey that every male wants to go experience. And so that I deeply connected with that. How many people that. were in your class? At the academy, about 700. That's what you started with, right? We, we started with about 1,200 and then it whittles down to 700 along the way. How long does it take for the uh, whittling? To the big whittle must be in year one. Oh, yeah. Year one, they show up and they realize like this is they call all their friends who are at the frat party and having a kegger <laughs> and, and you know meeting members of the opposite sex. And they say because you, I, I left the academy two times my freshman year. And the rest of the time I was in the dorm studying, I was still doing, you know, amazing things. I was, you know, getting in incredible shape and, and being held to a very high standard intellectually and physically and, and you know, to other standards. But I was not having fun. I mean, it's 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 so a how crucial. Many people, how many? What did what, you came out of your freshman year? How many people were? How many of the twelve hundred were remaining going into sophomore year? We were probably down to about nine hundred at that point. Okay, so that's a so big we lose three hundred. Okay. Oh yeah. And then you it's had two hundred more to go. Yep. 
And, and uh, some of those were non-voluntary, right? Because we live in under an, under an honor code as well. Okay. And so we will not lie, cheat, or steal, nor tolerate among us anyone who does. And uh, and then if somebody caught got caught cheating or stealing, that was automatic expulsion from the mm-hmm. academy. What happens to those people? You know, that's a great question. I, th- I think it's a it's really like hard. Not really in the well. I guess you are in the service at that time, but you know, it's the dishonorably discharged kind of a uh, of a label. You know, I think they still get an honorable discharge because they haven't really started their career. They haven't graduated okay. yet. I'm not. I'm not sure because it's been a while since I've I've looked at that. But it is. It's it's funny. I, I know some of the people that had that on their record, and it's just a a crossroads in life that's really unfortunate. That that always stays with them, and uh, and for for whatever for whatever reason, I, I see a lot of them struggle to get past that point. And and it's just another great. I mean, even if you don't live under an honor code, I think that mm-hmm. we're still all susceptible to that same type of judgment, right? As you think about kids in other colleges, they're making equally weighty decisions at that right. point in their life. And so whether, regardless of whether or not it's the grace in those, in those systems, right. Is this wide versus the grace in your system is this wide, you know, at the, at the academies. Yes. But I also think the grace and consequences has tightened for the first time in their lives as well. So maybe the consequence is, you know, you can't, you can't make the grade and you're kicked out of college or you get pregnant or you get hooked on drugs. I think this is the first time for all of us, you know, it's a very public um, consequence when when you're kicked out of an academy for an honor violation, but you, you have just as impactful consequences that these kids at other colleges are enduring, I think, at the same time. Yeah, I think society and, you know, society in general knows that somebody is a cheater or a liar or whatever, and we sort of stand back, right? We yeah. we just know. And, uh, but, you know, to be labeled so clearly, yes. which is now politically incorrect, right? Mm-hmm. You know, in uh, in general society, uh, I guess you kind of walk away and you either have to say, I remember there was a guy that was in a Bible study me one time and we were talking about when did you learn that you were a sinner? And he said, when I was six years old, there's a guy from Cleveland, not more your way. OK, he mm-hmm. said, when I was six years old, he said, I remember uh, I was asked a question by um, a teacher and I lied and I stopped and I said, oh, my God, I'm a liar. <laughs> I thought that was really, but to be labeled that, you yeah. know, from the academy, you know, you walk away and I think you either have to kind of lead with that, you know, or try to hide it and try to hide it for the rest of your life is uh, it's a tough way to go. Tough right. To go. It's, just, it's a scarlet letter on your soul a bit, even if you, do, even if no one else knows about it, yeah. you do personally. You and do. it's, and yeah. I think it's a good lesson for kids as they do enter that time period that that we're keeping score, you know, regardless of whether or not you have an honor code above you, we are holding you accountable to a code from Mm -hmm. this point forward. You don't, you don't get the do overs you had in high school and years prior. I, you know, that I had made many mistakes in in that time period prior to that. They don't affect me today. um, And nobody talks about them, but if I had done that in college, it would have been a different story. So how many of the 700 that you graduated with, went to jets. So then about 300 of us get a pilot training slot period, right? So we go from 700 to 300. And then out of those 300, about 10% will get, is that a little bit high? Let's see. Is it for a class of 30? No, it's 1%. No, it is 10%. Uh, 10% will get fighter planes. So now we're down to 30 out of that group. 30 out of 700. Yep. 30 out of 700. But 30 and then out, out of those 300 that wound up getting flight training. Exactly. Okay. Because yep. <laughs> all the rest are flying the big planes and they do incredible missions. I don't want to you know dis- dismiss anything that they do. It's incredible. But um, the, if you really wanted to be a fighter pilot, your chances were about 40% that you'd have a, a pilot slot coming out of the academy. And then it's about 10% after that, that you're going to be a fighter pilot. And then once you get into fighter pilot training, we'll still lose one or two per class of eight um, that just washes out because they can't do uh, the, the flying that's required of them. So it's a about where as the, where the one to two of the thirty go to at that point. They go the, back. They go back to the uh, the big planes and they get to the tell stories planes. about okay. flying they fighters. They don't go out. Yeah. They don't. They don't become. They they're still pilots in the Air Force. They're just not yes. flying jets, fighter jets. Okay, hundred percent. And sometimes they'll make a mistake that's so big that they're not flying anymore. But you know, ninety percent of the time, it's uh, they get transitioned over to a big plane. So why did you make it? 
I think. Um, what before I ask that? I always, I was somebody's got to know this. I'm like, what happens to the other four hundred guys? They, they guys and live, gals, because you now have you have it's a co-ed, right? So you have guys oh, and yeah. gals. You have four hundred that don't go to flight training. Where do they go? So at first they're devastated. They go back you know, to West Point. Where, where, where do they go? Okay. They, they, what 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 we would have said in 1999 when I graduated is that they become part of the support uh, roles of the Air Force, and, and which was which is really true then. Today that's not true. Today we have equally important um, roles coming out of the military, coming out of the Air Force Academy. You can go into a space role now and possibly be an astronaut without ever having flown a plane. You can go into um, a remotely piloted aircraft role. So there's all these other things. It's not like that's, there's this pinnacle role like there was when I was at the Academy of being a fighter pilot. That's a good thing. Now they have they have all these other opportunities and a breadth of experience um, that, that's important for oh, the so mission. You can get into drones and all that other kind of oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. There's so many other opportunities because there's so much more technology. That's exactly. part of the battlefield, in effect, right? Yep. Yeah. I never thought of it that way. But yeah. But in the old days, that's uh, like when you were there, the old days, 95, you graduated in what, 99? Graduated in 99. Yeah. So you've got a situation where you say, yeah, the pinnacle was fighter, fighter jets. Yep. Okay. And so why you? So a couple of things what I have to have. What made you, you know, a viable fighter pilot? I, I absolutely have to credit the system um, because one thing that's true about the system that you are put through is if you do what they tell you, then you're going to be successful. You are, if you go home and you visualize the flight the day before and you study and you do everything that you're supposed to, you will be pulled through this and, and, and be successful. And I think it's, it's a, before I go on, it's a really important point that we miss telling kids. We tell kids all the time, you can be whatever you want, go figure it out, you know, follow your passion. And I think that's, that's kind of a useless statement and it's, and it sends them in the wrong direction because they don't know the path they're supposed to take. They, they really don't have an idea for the structure they should go pursue. And so what's yeah, more it valuable. allows me not to commit for the long, for maybe all my life. Exactly. Exactly. And, and so I think it's much more valuable, particularly at a, at a young age, to be pushed into a system that's going to say, we are going to work you exceptionally hard. This is going to be the most difficult thing you ever did. But if you obey the rules of this system and you do the things we tell you, you're going to be spit out of it, massively transformed. So that's what happened to me. So you asked how, why you me? Believed it. They told you that and you believed yep. it. You know, 100%. The thing I, that I, I talk to people that want to be entrepreneurs, you know, coming out of college. Yeah. And I always, I'm a big believer that you should go to work for a corporation. And the reason is because they're going to teach you. They're going to teach you the disciplines of business. So, and at the same time, you're learning an industry, okay, which yep. is incredibly valuable. All right. And, uh, and you learn it with no risk, right? I mean, there's no downside risk. And so you kind of, you, uh, I, I really think that that's really important. It's the same. It's the same principle you talked about. I didn't. I didn't think about it in the military, but it's exactly the same principle. Couldn't agree more. You got to pick it up. You could learn. It's sort of like, no, no, no. Don't worry about it. You can learn to be a fighter pilot on your own. Right. <laughs> yeah. Ridiculous, uh, right? Yep. Exactly. That's ridiculous. And then and we yeah, tell I could say I'm going to come out of college and I'm going to run a fifty million dollar business. You know, in three years. On my own, really. <laughs> but go ahead. And we worship that. We 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 celebrate the Zuckerbergs of the world, and we miss the fact that for every Zuckerberg, there's ten thousand other kids that fell flat on their face. They may, might have missed the opportunity to jump into the employment system in a gr in a great place. And and so because we, we we in America, we just love that story of doing it from nothing. We we cherish intensity over consistency. And I think it should be the other way around. And and the consistency of following that path is is truly what gets us yeah. to the, the greater successes. Well, if you life. look at the bell-shaped curve of entrepreneurs, you know, where is the majority of the entrepreneurs? Yeah, there is going to be that far to the right sort of, you know, Bill Gates and, yeah. and Steve Jobs and Zuckerberg. And, but the generally speaking, the bell-shaped curve is uh, is like 35 to 40. <laughs> Yeah, as far as age group goes for starting companies, because you finally have enough life experience and you have enough network within business and you have enough discipline and skills and understanding to kind of build something. OK, exactly. <laughs> it is. It's amazing. But who has that? You know, when you put Zuckerberg on the cover of everything, you know, then everybody's right. like, well, I want to be him. 
I can't yeah. remember, can't tell you how many people said that they wanted to be Steve Jobs. People remember Steve Jobs got fired. Yeah. In the mid 80s. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they said, you know, we can't have you around. You, you're a disruption. Then he went away and he sort of learned and then came back and was really a much, much better leader and manager at that point. Night and day. Yeah, I love the Steve Jobs story. It's he had early success because he had exceptional product market fit, which is really what the Zuckerbergs of the world had too. They don't understand business. They understand one product and they're able to great, create great product market fit, but that's not a scalable business. And so Zuckerberg's lucky. He was surrounded by other people who were able to mask the fact that he had no business sense because he just couldn't. I don't care what anybody says. Smart it wasn't his. Listen. Yeah, exactly. Smart enough to listen. Yeah. You know, I gotta, smart enough I to listen give him credit right. for that, you know. Yep. He didn't know best. He might have known best in that problem that you're talking about that he had to solve. But yep. as far as how do I build the rest of this stuff, he was listening to the VCs and the board of directors that he had accumulated. Pretty, pretty interesting. Yep. Hundred yeah. percent right, and Steve Jobs didn't, and you see that as he brought on that executive from Pepsi who ultimately replaced him, Scully, I think his name was. Yeah, John Scully. Scully. Yeah. yeah, John Scully, and and he got uh, and, and he brought him on board, and, and Scully effectively looked around and said, "There's no structure, there's no sophistication right. here. They're button heads," and they said, "Jobs, you're out," and and Jobs had to go learn that for the next ten years at Next, and finally he went to Pixar and and Apple again, but that was only after he had earned that earned his stripes. And do the thing he should have done first. And I would say that what he learned to do while he was at Next and Pixar is he learned to listen. Mm -hmm. In other words, these that product market fit. I can have the best skill in the world in this particular area, but I lot I need to listen in these other areas. He wasn't listening when he was at Apple mm -hmm. at one point, and so they 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 cut him at that point. But when he came back, you know, take product market fit and combine it with all of those things that he learned. It's turned into a $2 trillion company, which is pretty amazing or whatever it is. I think it's $2 trillion. But uh, so we were talking. So you said one of the things that you did to, to be a fighter pilot is you believe the system. Yep. You said, okay, I'll go. I'll play. I'll do what you tell me to do. And here's what was happening in the back of my mind. A couple of things. One, my instincts were telling me I'm not ready for this, that I'm not capable of doing this. You know, I have a healthy dose of imposter syndrome, which I think a lot of successful people do that. That little voice in the back of their head, the self-doubt that says that you're, you're not ready to do this. You have. Uh, and, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, telling me. And, and I think that's once again, because it's you natural. Did, academically, you probably did pretty well at the academy, I would think. Yeah, I definitely got to the point where I was comfortable with the tests. You know, if you're going to give me an aerodynamic test, I'm going to ace it. If you're going to, you know, tell me, test me on systems for the airplane, I'll do fine on that. But in terms of, you know, taking an airplane, going upside down by myself over, you know, 18,000 feet over Mississippi, three weeks after I started flying, which is the time frame that you're doing this, um, you know, that's that there's definitely a, the self-doubt is pretty loud in the back of your head. Do you ever and express so the self-doubt among your peers at that time? Or does everybody go and like, oh, no, no, I'm great. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be the best pilot and the whole thing. We definitely have is a shared, <laughs> yeah. shared sense of excitement about it. And, a shared, and that was contagious and really positive, meaning that, that we, we did have a shared momentum and, and inertia going in the right direction. But we would say like, when we, like every morning, just for an example, my, I had four roommates. One of my roommates would throw up off our balcony every single morning. <laughs> he, I mean, he was just primally terrified of what was going to happen. He's a, still a pilot today. He flies uh, for an airline. He does a great job. And he's phenomenal. But, uh, but that's how primal this fear was in the sense, this self-doubt. You know, it's one thing to self be, have self-doubt about acing the test in school. It's another thing to have self-doubt that now is manifesting. And am I going to live through today? Yeah. What gonna have to do? <laughs> it gets to be pretty serious. Yeah. So, he wouldn't talk about why he was throwing up, but everybody was like, man, that could be me, right? <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad he's throwing up and not me. I'm just able to hold it down. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's great. <laughs> so when did you get past all, when did you stop being an imposter and gain and get to that point where you said, yeah, this is me and I, I can do this? What I learned, particularly through pilot training, was that even with that imposter's voice telling me I can't do it. Because I think that, entrepreneurs are that way, right? I think we all sure. start saying, you know, man, I can never be that. You know, I want to be that. And I talk tough, but I don't know. So, 100%. Yeah. So, and, and so, 
for me, it was that growth mindset. And, and so what I had to, what I had to finally trust in and be, and really pilot training is what ultimately taught me that, that, um, I was taken from feeling like I couldn't do it. And I, and I certainly couldn't do it and early on. I struggled just like everybody else did. And I watched my instructors do this so naturally, just like they were breathing, like driving a car, you know, just as simple as that. And I, but I trusted in the potential to grow and the system that I was a part of. And it's really been a superpower since then. And I think it's a good combination, actually. I think that a healthy dose of imposter syndrome is, syndrome is good because we need to be reminded that we're not ready. Most of the time, we're not ready. I mean, that's, that's just Most the, of the, the fact of life. We are not ready. You know, they exactly. say that that's a big difference between men and women when they, when they apply for promotions. Yeah. Did you hear that? You know that, right? Now, most men will do it knowing that they're being an imposter, they're not ready, but women right. won't do it generally because they must know that they are ready. Yeah. And, and that's okay. the, that's, I think a, a trap we fall in because so I think imposter syndrome is good only to the extent that it lights a fire under our feet towards that growth mentality. And, and that mm -hmm. mentality that says, I'm not there today, but I have the ability to be there and I'm going to work harder than anybody else along that path to get there. And that's, that's what I was taught. I was taught yeah. that there was you can't, a path. You to can't follow. remain an imposter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that's it, dangerous. Yeah, now I'm, I'm very confident with my flying abilities. I know I'm the man in an airplane. I know I'm the man in a, in a consulting environment. There are many times where I wasn't and I had to grow and I had to read a book a week and I had to do all these things to develop me and my team. And, uh, and, and, and so I don't say that with arrogance. I just say that because that's part of the journey that I had to take and others can take as well. Yeah. One of the things that you said in your book, I thought was interesting when you were thinking about going from flying, right. Being an elite fl fighter pilot here to going into business, you know, so this is when I guess you applied for your MBA yeah. you know, at UT is you were reading how many books a week in business did you start reading? You know, so I so wanted you would so that when you walked into the classroom, you didn't you didn't seem like an odd duck, right? Yeah, I knew none of the language. I'd spent the last ten years learning about missiles and airplanes, and uh, and I had to force myself to read at least a book a week uh, in order to just speak the language. And it was the it was the equivalent of going back to pilot training. And I think a lot of people miss that um, when they have to reinvent themselves in new chapters. And we all should seek to do that. We should, you know, there should be a, if you're going from a technician to that now that entrepreneur at 35 years old, you better believe you are reinventing yourself in some massive categories. So you better be willing to put in the same amount of effort you did the first time you, you came up the technical uh, stovepipe. And so for me, it just required learning a new language. And the great news there is How that- How many books did you read though? I just want to put this in perspective. So I definitely read a book a week and that was always my goal. The MBA program forced me to read even more. So I probably read, I don't know, two to three books a week. So what is that? A hundred, 150 books in that time frame. I never was, wow. I never was without. Well, I'm just sure. And I, I say that that's the dedication that you had that said, I am going to succeed at this. Okay. That's the kind of dedication it takes. I'm not going to kind of cruise into a classroom and sort of just be quiet and listen for a while and pick up a few terms and then sound smart about it. Okay. Because I had my imposter syndrome saying I'm not ready. Yeah. And I didn't respond to it. This is the important part that I didn't say, but I'm going to fake it. And I'm just going to, you know, go to class and, and get whatever I can. I said, I'm not ready, but I will be, I'm going to choose this growth path and do whatever it takes to get there. And that's, what's been transformative for me. Wow. That's cool. So what happened with, so how did your career go with, uh, like to your, you know, you, so you became a pilot. How old were you when you became a fighter pilot? 25 years old when I, uh, became a fighter pilot. And, uh, then you had it, how does a career progress for a, a fighter pilot? Where did it take you? And then where did you, uh, run into a wall? All careers have walls. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. So for me, um, I was progressing um, along the path and, and getting more proficient. My goals were to become an instructor, and uh, I became the chief instructor pilot at the headquarters for flight training for the Air Force. Um, I had, had, as you talked about in my book, I, I mastered uh, just about everything I wanted to accomplish in the plane. Certainly hadn't mastered everything, and there's, there's more I could do for an eternity. Are the um, best so pilots how always the best instructors? Not necessarily. I would say the best pilots are not always the best instructors, but the best instructors are always the best pilots. 
Meaning in order to be, if you're an incredible instructor, at some point you've had to synthesize what makes you great. And that required you to be already be a strong, uh, strong pilot and be able to distill that down into the critical few things to do. What skill did you need? So that's the skill that some of a pilot needs in order to become an instructor. Because there's, really there's knows what he's doing. It's just not unconscious knowledge. It's exactly. Conscious knowledge. It's exactly right. Okay. There's, 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 there's that unconscious competence that exists for a lot of people. You see it in sales all the time. They don't know why they succeed, but they just do. They have, you know, yeah. they, they, they kind of learn it intuitively, but when you get to that conscious competence level, that's when I think it, things are really accelerated and it's, it's difficult to do because now you have to scale it for the next person and really understand what makes you successful. But that's, that's, you know, kind of the mindset behind the methodology. Debriefing is all about, let's have that conversation for root cause, what's making the impact and then place that back into tomorrow's plan. How do you make the trans was it difficult to make the transition from being a great fighter pilot to being a great instructor because the fulfillment what you get how you get fulfilled and how you get you know uh motivated how you're motivated is very very different right very different but i think it's one that? of i think it's one of the most important transitions that we make in life i think it's a great allegory for, you know, kind of that midlife crisis as well. Because when I transitioned from being a fighter pilot to being an instructor, I had to move from pursuing my own personal success to pursuing significance with others and to be able to scale that with other people. And I, and I think with, that- With others you, or through others? Through others is a better yeah. way to say it. Yep. Yeah. Through other people. And So I think there's, I think we all have that tension in life as well. There's, you know, that 44 years old is the height of depression uh, in males. I'm 44 years old right now. And I think that's a good tension though, because of that same transition that took place when I was a fighter pilot, I think we all go through in life. I think you reach a point where all of your pursuits for your own ego and your own success and how can I pad my resume and tell my own story ultimately become a little fruitless. It's like that leader I told you about who said, I can't push him out the door for the 10th time for the 10th quarter, you know, 10% more effort. You start to wonder where's the fulfillment come from? And I think this is so great from a faith perspective and, and you, where you really start to unlock the, your, the potential that God's put in you is that that tension is good. The, the height of depression is there. Don't medicate it. Don't drink it away. Feel it. You know, feel that pain because what it's helping you to do is transition away from that first summit you were pursuing of personal success and ego building into the dissolution of your ego as you provide significance through others and, and scale that impact through many and other that people. for for uh from a career standpoint, that is the, I think that's the most difficult transition that I made, you know, that you were the best of the best of whatever you were doing. And Mm -hmm. now you want people to be saying, man, that team that Charlie runs or, you know, that Joel runs, they are really credible people, but it, they don't mention Joel or Charlie, you know? That's it. Yep. And and, (laughs) yeah. And you're doing, I was going to say, you're supposed to walk away I'm supposed to walk away and feel good, you know, and fulfill like, man, I really did a great job building these people up. You know, we move from sort of personal leadership to servant leadership, right? I mean, it's yes. Oh, boy, that's really hard to do. Really hard to do. So were you a great instructor? I would say instructing is one of my strongest gifts. Um, I think that uh, just because I did it so long, uh, it forced me. To, I did it. I spent, so I flew for 14 years. I spent about nine of those as an instructor. And so, yeah, I became an instructor early on and and then I got a chance to continue instructing. And so I was a bad instructor at first. And, you know, I did the the typical things just to just give them a checklist of a hundred things to do. A good instructor is someone who, to your, to your point, listens, you will use a Steve Jobs example again, who, who's able to listen and not just teach and, and throw up ideas and things to do to the other person, but listen to what's really taking place with them and then fine tune the approach so that they understand it. And you always have to translate it into their language. So when I'm explaining to somebody who I'm teaching how to fly formation, how I want them to fly, and I'll say, I want you to park yourself three feet away from my aircraft and I'm going to cross you under over to the other side. And here's what I want you to do. I know you haven't been flying very long, but you drive a car and you know what it feels like to change lanes in a car, right? So I want you to make it look like you're changing lanes with this plane. So you're going to pull the power back just enough to watch that other plane start to walk out in front of you. It's going to get to the point where you have nose tail separation. And then you're just going to do an almost imperceptible wing crack 
and you're going to start to slide over into that direction. So that's a lot easier for me to explain them how to do that maneuver using things I know they understand. I have to think from their perspective. And, and that took a long time for me to, to be able to develop. Like when you first started teaching, how would you have told them to do that? I would have done the book approach. I would have said, crack the throttles at half knob width. I want you to descend 10 feet below leads plane of motion. And then I want you to, to turn until, and I mean, all those things are technically accurate, right. but they, they don't take into consideration how it feels and what am I thinking while I'm doing it? And how can I, no, how can I, really great. Yeah. so you gave them an example that they go, oh, that all makes sense to me now. And so exactly. I get a picture of it and it works as opposed to a checklist of 10 things I need to do to slide under this my instructor's jet. That's, that's exactly pretty, right. That's pretty cool. I love where you say the the key to good instruction is listening, you know, which is the antithesis of what you would, when you think of instructor, you picture someone in front of the room instructing, right? Right. You know, that's, that's terrific. So then what happened at that time? So everything's going great. Talked and about, you know, this, this career, I always say every career has a, has a, some sort of a wall that it runs into. So for me, that wall was was really cancer. Uh, and that was, you know, at about the 11 year point in my career when I found out I had stage four cancer and and now had to contend with um, my, the end of my life. Most likely I did, you know, I'd given a very low, low chance of survival. How old and were you? I was 33 when that occurred. Were you married? Was married. I had two young kids, three and one years old. And uh, I was told to expect to be around for about another 18 months with them. Did it just sort of show up? I mean, was there? There were some signs for about a year um, when I would fly that my G-suit, which is pants that inflate against your body so you can pull G's because when you pull G's, you weigh more. My, my body weighs nine times more and the blood would try to leave my head. And I'd have to squeeze all my muscles to push the blood back up in my head. We wear these pants that inflate that, that help you to push the blood back up in your head. Okay. When it would do that, it would push against my abdomen, and I have a little bit of pain, like a two on a scale of one to ten. Okay. And um, and so I'd, I'd bring it up to the doctors. And what did the doctors say? The doctors would say, "Ah, you've been working out too hard, or you got a little infection." So we had these conversations for about a year, and they're probably right to do that. I gave them no reason physically mm -hmm. to to think that there's anything wrong with me besides this little pain. And and, the and then finally, when you're dealing with somebody who's thirty years old. What could be wrong with them? Yeah. I mean, you were a perfect physical set, uh, specimen. I'm sure that you were in phenomenal shape and everything else, yeah. right? I mean, the group that you hang around with, and not a lot of uh, big fat guys sort of <laughs> drinking exactly. beer every night and eating pizza, okay? <laughs> that's that's not the fighter pilot way. <laughs> yep. One so of the, one you don't of the think that. You really don't think that people can get sick at that age. I mean, really. I mean, it's not seriously. Like you said, it's maybe an infection or something or go away especially without other symptoms. I mean, it's weird to think that the only way that this presents is just this little pain I have in my abdomen. You'd think that I would get, you know, an unexplic inexplicable weight loss or, you know, just all these other symptoms. And I just didn't have that. Yeah. And it was stage four by the time we found it. So it was all over my body by the time uh, we oh, caught it. God. And yet, yeah, it hadn't really manifested itself. So what, what was that path like? I mean, like you said, you're 33 years old, you're married, you got a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And you're sitting there. How long were you married at the time? Four years or something? Yeah, this was uh, six years. So 2010, we got married in 04. So six years at that six point. Six years. And uh, I mean, you had a wife who married a fighter pilot, you know. Mm -hmm. She married She married John Glenn here, you know. <laughs> the perfect guy. And uh, now he's not perfect, you know. And uh, their, your life was perfect. Everything was on course. You knew exactly what your trajectory was going to be. And then this. Yep. How do you get, how did you, how did you deal with that? Like what well, were the first, steps that you had to go through, you know, to uh, deal with somebody who's saying you can die from this? The first thing you do is get really angry and say, this isn't fair. And, uh, you know, I've done everything right. To your point, I, I, I was in great shape. I wasn't the guy who did drugs. I, you know, I didn't take chances. I, I, I made a lot of smart decisions leading up to this point. And, uh, and so this wasn't the conclusion that I was expecting. So I was bitter about that. And I was angry at God that that took place. And then in addition to the anger is just the debilitating sense of terror 
and uh, and and just you know, and thinking to yourself that every day is the best day you're going to have for the rest of your life. And today really wasn't that good. And it's, you know, it's on a sliding scale from That's this point forward. That's the thought forward. that you have? Right. Yeah. Today's going to be, where did that come from? It came from the fact that, you know, telling me I had 18 months to live I, and, and I could see my symptoms progressively Somebody getting worse. told you that? Oh yeah. They said, yeah, it, it, that's what, so I actually looked into, you know, of course I Googled it and I saw the the stats and, and how long you're supposed to live and it confirmed that too. We, uh, I can't remember if I put this in the book or not, but there was a uh, point when a doctor was reading me his, what he was putting into the system and he'd type this all out and he got to the part where it talked about my lifespan because he wrote like two paragraphs. He was literally just reading every sentence to me and I'm, I'm reading it along with him. He got to the part about 18 months and he pauses almost imperceptibly. He skipped the sentence and he went on to the next one. We both read it. We both knew what just happened. And I, and I he didn't thought, want to say it out loud. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you didn't want to read it either, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I was fine with that. Let's not cover that. Let's pretend we don't have that in there. Was yeah. this, uh, did you have surgery? I did. So I had massive surgery, removed all or part of four organs and uh, removed part of my bladder, uh, you know, moved part of my small intestine, my large intestine, of course, my appendix where it all started. And, uh, and then they zipped me up and said, um, we, it's in your lymph nodes. It was in other organs, which most likely means we didn't find it all. I mean, we just, we can't open you up and look everywhere. So we'll have to wait and see where it's, it's also stuck that we don't know about and, uh, and just take it from there, but it's not going to be good. You know, it, effectively it's all over from this point. How did you, how did, uh, your wife of six years, how did she deal with this when, when it all sort of to unfold? She was a rock star. She, she, she was the type of woman who I would have described as a little bit of a, let me I'll use a funny word, a wimp, you know, kind of not a, she, she wasn't super strong mentally and, and, you know, she, I loved her to death and she was the perfect mate for me, but I wouldn't, I, I would be the one that would provide strength for us. And then all of a sudden those roles. Because she, so she's the woman who married a, she married a fighter pilot. Yeah, and all of a exactly. sudden a fighter pilot ain't a fighter pilot. You know, so I'm curled up in the fetal position. I mean, I mean, just, yeah, like yeah. fighter pilots don't do that, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know? And and she immediately stepped into that void and, and found that strength. And and what I didn't know at the time was because I always saw her super positive. She would go take breaks and she would walk like through Target and cry, or she would go sit in the car and 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 sob. And but I would never see that. She was she was. Where did she um, find she, your strength? Where is she? Yeah, because I'm sure that the other way she could have gone is like to her mother. I mean, mom, right. I can't handle this, you know, you know, and then all of a sudden the families kind of come in, but she's not, yeah. she's not sort of leading the charge, you know, she's just looking for somebody else to sort of take, to be the fighter pilot and take over, if you will. Right. But she didn't Definitely find that. So where did she find that uh, for faith? Yeah, for sure. So she's, she's say, always been very strong. In her faith, she she comes from a very uh, religious is the wrong word, but just very much re relationship based uh, faith mentality from her parents and what she grew up with. She's a Texas Baptist, and okay. uh, and and that was just that's always been part and partial for everything she did. And and so the, at the time when she needed it most, it was it was there. So the same girl who would be upset when she spilled her purse. Uh, you know, the year prior, all of a sudden was dealing with this massive disruption and, and possibly the end of my life and, and doing it with flying colors. One of the things that you mentioned in the book was about prayer and that there was a consistency that your wife first prayed for you. This was before, I think, your operation. OK. And then uh, as all this bad news just sort of just kept coming out so rapidly, too, it wasn't. Yeah wasn't like, well, let's talk about this over the next three years. It like happened in like three days. Okay. Right. <laughs> and uh, she prayed for you. And then you're, then you actually went with her to your pastor and pray. Mm -hmm. And, and then one thing you said in the book, which just kind of blew my mind is that where did that consistency come? What were the prayers that they, that they. So had? the prayers, the prayers started as Lord, uh, take this from me. I don't deserve this. Heal me. This is, um, you. this is me. The, okay. and are, are you asking for Marsha? I'm asking first for you, then for Marsha, and then for the pastor. Because, yep. yeah. For me, it was first, um, take it from me. I don't deserve this. Um, I'm angry with you, God. You need to heal me right now. And what that transitioned to, and I think, you know, one of the most important lessons I took from this 
was that I was able to authentically say, God, let your will be done and give me the courage to accept it. And so I'd stopped praying for healing. I stopped praying to get better at a certain point. And uh, because partially because of some experiences I had and uh, some, some humility uh, and, and then the conversation with my pastor and then, then this interaction with this, uh, with this little girl who also had cancer that well, tell me that about was the pastor first. Yep. Yeah. So when I went to church, well, you, you know, tell me what Marsha prayed for and then tell me what he prayed for and what he, what he told you. Marsha was, was stronger earlier than I was. So she'd pr- pray for my healing too, but she, she would pray much more biblically and, 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 you know, take this cup from us, but let your will be done at the same time. And, and so she was a great example of that for me. I wasn't ready to do that yet. She was willing to have open hands and let you yeah. go if that was God's will. She was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which That's is a fine line. Heart. That's a fine line. Does she love me or not? Right. Right. Yeah. I don't know if it's a good thing or yeah, bad thing. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I, in, 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 in sincerity, of course, this, this was just terrifying from her, not just from losing her mates, but this is, you know, losing security. She would be stuck with two boys to raise yeah. and just everything else about this new life that she was for all practical purposes was going to happen. I mean, the doctors did make no, made no bones about it. Like this is very low likelihood. I would survive this. Um, so the pastor so, situation. Yeah. what's that? So tell me about the pastor. So I went to the pastor and, um, I, I went up front and, and we, we had talked to him a couple of times. I greatly, greatly respected him. Loved his sermons. And, uh, and so I was excited to talk to him from the perspective. I just needed some relief and some, you know, some wise words. And so we went up to him and, and I already have, you know, tears welling up in my eyes. And so does Marsha. And I said, we just got to talk to you right after church, you know, like come down to the front of the, of the pulpit. And, uh, and I said to him, like, we got some bad news over the past couple of weeks. It looks like, uh, I have cancer and it looks like stage four. And he said, well, what's the prognosis? look like? And I said, it doesn't look good. I said, everything that I'm hearing and reading is not pointing in a positive direction. And so next, what I was really hoping he would say is, well, let's pray for your healing. And, and God heals, you know, God pulls off miracles. And that's, you no, know, that's what this is for. And I'm glad you came to me because we need to have this conversation. We lay, lay hands on you and let's have that dialogue. But instead, he said, he, he paused for a moment and you could tell that he was welling up with tears now too. And he said, well, sometimes Joel, it's our job to show the world how a Christian dies. <laughs> what, <laughs> and what, what was that? Do you remember what thought you had when he, when he said that? Anger, anger and defeated. Cause this is the one person I was going to go to, to tell me hope. it was going to be all right. Yeah. He was the hope. And he was the, he was the person that was supposed to tell me everything was going to be fine. But he tell he told me something much more valuable, and that was that it, we all have a death sentence, effectively. And it was not what I wanted to hear in that moment. But since then, I've 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 come to come around to, to believe that's exactly what I needed to hear because that helped me to make the transition. Um, it is a little bit self. I mean, it, every, look, all of us have a survival mechanism. We all want to live forever. But at the end of the day, the death and the transition that we're going to go through is, 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 you know, the future for all of us. And I had to learn that that was a transition just like anything else in life. And, and I had to let, put that in God's hands. And I finally got to the point where I believed that God was either going to lead me from this back into good health for time or through this into eternity with him. But he ultimately uh, had the victory one direction or the other. And that's that this pastor helped me to see that as I reflected on his words. And you said someone else helped you too. Yeah. So it's hard to go from I'm angry. Right. To, to what you just described as accepting. And and you did write that in your book, that thing about that God's either going to lead me back to good health or he's going to lead me into eternity. And that, that had a huge impact on me when I read that, you know, and, uh, but it was interesting to me how you want the, how you got there. Okay. Yeah. You know, the pastor was one of the wife was one, the pastor's one, right? These are, you also had the chemotherapy people, right? You know, that you were with, you know, you saw them struggling. So as a group, now you're not hanging around with fighter pilots, you're hanging around with people, some of who will get well and some of whom won't. And you saw it 
real time. Okay. But then tell me about this, uh, this trip to MD Anderson that you made. So we're about five weeks into our cancer journey. So if you can imagine the progress has taken up to this point, I find out that there's a mass uh, that they need to investigate. Don't worry, Joel, it's probably not cancer. You're in great shape. Then, you know, the next week it was, eh, now we think it's cancer. Uh, let's, you, we got to be careful with this. To the next week, it's cancer. It's an incredibly rare type of cancer and it's stage four. Uh, and we don't know what to do next to, you know, finally getting access off the military installation to go get taken care of. And so I've gone through a nightmarish five weeks as you know, the news just kept getting worse and worse every day. I'd wake up to something that worked. The worst case scenario kept coming true. And, uh, and this should have been a little bit of a respite from that. This should have been a moment when I felt good about things. I'm going to go to the, the hospital where they can treat me, where they, you know, they've seen this before. Cause in the military, I was the first one ever to get this type of cancer. So we're driving over to this the hospital. First one ever to what you kind of, Sorry, first one ever to get this type of cancer. Oh, that type of cancer. Okay. Yeah. And I was the first ever. Uh, and so was we're it driving. Appendix type cancer. Is that what it was? Yeah. Mucinous adenocarcinoma of the appendix. Okay. And uh, just incredibly rare. Okay. And so I'm driving with the family. My two kids are in the back and I'm driving and, and Marsha's in the car with me. And we're driving to this hospital. We're going from San Antonio to Houston. It's about a three hour drive. And it should be a bit of a weight off my shoulders because I'm going to finally see people that know how to deal with this cancer and they can prolong my life and treat me the right way. But instead I just have this overwhelming sense of dread, uh, as I'm driving this three hour drive. And I can't really put my finger on why I feel this way the entire time. And we get in front of the hospital and marsha has got to go park the car. So I get out and she, she drives away and now I'm by myself and I'm in downtown Houston and I'm walking up to this hospital that's 20 stories high, just a massive building downtown Houston. And as I'm looking at this building, looking straight up at it, it dawns on me why I have this overwhelming sense of dread. And it's because I'm walking into the building that I'm going to die in. And in one of these windows that I'm, I'm staring at, one of these windows, I'm going to take my last look outside uh, and probably pretty soon in the next six months to 18 months. And the entire weight of everything I've been carrying up and trying to act so strong through up until this point just came crashing down on me. And I slowed down my walk and I stopped and on, on the sidewalk in front of all these people going by, I just closed my eyes and I have tears streaming down my face. And I said, God, this is not fair. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I'm uh, you know, I'm a fighter pilot. I, I made the right decisions and this is not fair. You need to heal me right now. I have young kids that need to see their dad throughout their life. I have a wife that I don't want to leave behind. You need to take this from me right now and you need to heal me. And I was angry and I had tears streaming down my face and I felt so righteous, righteously angry as this is all taking place. And, and I remember just through a deep scowl, opening my eyes back up. And through my tears, I lock eyes with another person. And this other person is staring right at me, beautiful blue eyes. I'll never forget them. And as she's looking at me, I can tell that this person who's about nine years old has a bald head and a surgical mask on in her eyes I can tell that this little girl is afraid and she's being wheeled in by her dad. And as she's staring at me and I see that fear in her eyes, a light switch went off in my mind and I went from the lowest moment in my life, complete self-absorption to saying, God, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I'm a 33 year old fighter pilot living every little boy's dream. I have two boys in the family. That's amazing. And a beautiful wife. And that little girl will not live to be a teenager don't help me heal her. <laughs> and, and the doors close behind her and her father. And I'm just left there struck thinking, what the heck just happened? And I'm trying to make sense of all of this. And I know something transformative just occurred. And, and as I look back on it now, what I realize is the following, God actually answered my prayer that second. It's one of the few times I can, I can say, you know, that the, the prayer was answered immediately. Cause I said to God, you need to heal me. And I directed him. You need to heal me right now. And he 
absolutely healed me. It wasn't in the way I wanted to be healed. It was in the way I needed to be healed in that moment and to have that perspective and have that gratitude and have that humility. And I said, if I can go from the worst moment in my life, the lowest I've ever felt to completely selfless in the next second and empathizing and, com- and connecting with this, with this other human being, then I can make that decision at every point forward in my life, whether it's 18 months or 80 years. And I said, all right, I'm going to commit to do that. I'm going to quit feeling sorry for myself and I'm going to own my reaction from this point forward. That's a, that's a powerful story. That's really great. But how do you, how do you hold on to that moment? You follow me? How do you, it's one thing that it happens mm-hmm. and then things, obviously you're still here. So things started going your way. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you hold on to that selflessness, you know, and not sort of go back to just being Joel the fighter or Thor the fighter pilot? You know what I right. mean? It's, it's, I'm back, man. I'm back. <laughs> it has to be a conscious decision every day. And it's, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing because what happens is this. You, when you have this brush with death, you, you then get your life back. So I got my life back. Obviously, I'm health, healthy and things are going fantastic for me now. But then, a couple months later, you're sitting in traffic and somebody cuts you off and you have another bad day and you realize those things still affect you. And even though that, you know, if you only could get this one thing back in your life and you didn't have cancer, your life would be perfect and you would never take anything for granted again or the things you tell yourself when you're going through it. But of course, you fall back and they're susceptible to your old ways um, and your old habit patterns on the other side of that. And so I've always, I was no different. W- w- the way I combat that and the way I carry that lesson every day is one, by telling this story as often as I can. That's why I wrote the book. That's why if you follow me on social media, you'll see me talking a lot about this and and reinforcing it because multiple times throughout the day, I forced myself to pause for a moment and and think about the the gratitude I have for the second chance. And uh, and, and for a second chance that I most didn't get and that I get to decide what happens in, in, in how I react to everything in my life and that I'm extremely grateful for. Well, one of the things that happened is at that moment with that with that little girl, which I I really do encourage people to read the book and to hear the story in great detail, which you tell it in great detail. And uh, I couldn't stop reading it. So I kind of read it straight through and just really enjoyed it. But the uh, your partner, your co-author in this thing, Chris Strickland, OK, mm-hmm. uh, he makes a, a comment um Towards the towards the end, I can't. You, this is when both of you are sort of summarizing what's gone on in your or what new perspective you have in life. And he talks about taking off. I think he was in Af. Uh, I think he was he wasn't in Afghanistan. I'm, I'm not sure where he was. I think he was because he said he saw Mississippi and Alabama and all meeting. He takes off in a very very bad storm and he winds up getting above it. Yeah, you know, and uh, it's all clear blue sky, just gorgeous. And he said, eventually the, the clouds start parting and he could see, he gets this, the curvature of the earth and all this. Other, and it just, uh, he said, but those people down there, they're sitting there in the midst of a storm and yeah. they don't realize how beautiful this is up here. You know, it's this different perspective. And I thought when I read that, I thought of you with this young lady, this nine-year-old girl, and in, you instantly got a new perspective. Okay? Right. And it was uh, one way to do it is to say it was me seeing her in her life. Another one is, but God answered this prayer, as you say. So it's yeah. really almost seeing God's perspective. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Whole thing, right? I mean, I never thought of it that way. Yeah. It's really God's perspective on this situation. You go like, because your perspective at that time was I'm looking at a window in a hospital on some floor and saying that might be the room yeah, <laughs> where I'm going to die. And it was, so the perspective was all basically looking at me and now I'm looking at her and it just changed everything. Uh, so this point comes then to me, it seems like that's when you said, I'm just going to trust God. That's another way to say it. Right. Is that true? I think you just trust God, but you have to be sure that you are willing to trust God to the destination. So in other words, it's one thing to say, I trust God to get me healthy. 
you know, I, 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 tr- <laughs> <laughs> I, I trust God to beat this, um, this cancer, but it's another thing to say, I trust God even through this going badly and me taking my last breaths and all the scary things that you have, we can all think of for death and, and that transition that's going to take place. I trust him in that as well. And that's what I grew into from all of these experiences. And that's what was so powerful for me. And that's what was so wonderful and so powerful to me about Marsha's prayer. Before your first operation, this is within the first week or so that you know this, of yeah. what's, what might happen and how bad it might be. Um, but before you went through that whole process, you know, her prayer was, I trust God. Yep. And uh, with whatever, you know, whatever his plan is, whichever way he's going to play this thing out, I trust him. And so she got there really fast. She did. Okay. And I challenged it. I, I even said, like, do, does, does God have a plan? Like, I don't feel a plan. I did, did. And that's because what I really meant was I don't feel a plan to get healthy. I don't feel a plan to, to my end of this that I want. I didn't, I didn't trust that God's plan would ultimately be sovereign to what I could come up with. So people might know where, how, the, what this journey sort of was like that you faced. What were the odds of survival on this with this cancer? <laughs> So uh, a five-year survivor rate, because that's how, how they talk about these things. Um, five-year survivor rate with my stage cancer was 15%, one five. And then every day after that, it goes down. So, I mean, you could hit, you could hit five years and die the next day and you're still part of that 15%, which was the likely cause, right? It's, it's not it's, like the chances of me talking to you right now, 11 years later, a tenth of a percent. I don't know. I, I mean, just the, the, so you're yeah, that's walking, not it. You're in effect medical walking miracle in effect. 100%. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 did the doctor at uh, did you, your your uh, cancer doctor down there at MD Anderson? Does he does you still stay in touch with him? Does he did he say that about you? I definitely stay in touch with him, and he says that uh, you know, he he would he would say that he's I'm the result of medical um, you know good medical work, and that that's that's what they're going for. Um, he wouldn't call it a miracle, even though he's a faithful guy too. He still he he still sees his process as as part of the the conclusion, and I'm sure that's part of it too. Um, but you know, statistically it's, it's certainly in the miracle category. Wow. Wow. Uh, I remember one thing that you said in there is that when you were going to get this news as to what, whether, I think it was when you went to MD Anderson and, uh, you thought your markers were actually going back up. Right. And that the cancer had in fact returned, uh, you were walking in and you were saying, no matter what answer I get, I'm going to say, praise God. Yep, exactly Which right. I'm like, really? And so this showed the level of trust, okay? And then you go there, and of course, the answer you got was just the opposite of what you expected because the markers actually retreated, yep. okay? And they said, you don't have this cancer anymore. And <laughs> that was a true praise God moment. And here you are today, which is pretty amazing. So and then, and I, yeah. Yeah, I said, I wasn't going to break down. That was my commitment to myself. As I walked in, I said, all right, I'm going to say, praise God, no matter what, when I get the bad news, I'm not going to break down. And I'm just going to say, praise God. And I, you know, I'm putting my new faith to the test. I had this experience with this little girl and this pastor, and, and this is difficult and I'm terrified, but I can do this. And then they told me the good news that they couldn't, that the tumor markers had retreated and, and I'd gotten better. And then, of course, I just absolutely broke down at that point and, and it said, praise God, but it was, <laughs> I lost it because uh, I wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> yeah. To put an end to this story, I want to tell you that uh, having read this in your book, that little girl, I can picture her eyes. And here's just no, no, no conversation, no, nothing but a look that changed your life. A yep. look, those blue eyes look at you, you see the fear in those eyes. And I just think that's amazing how God works, you know, how subtle that sign was and how how powerful it was all at the same time for you. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'll ever ever forget that. And uh, you bring her back three or four times in the book. Yep. You know, while you tell your story. So she was really a catalyst used by God to sort of change Joel from the fighter pilot to this sort of next stage in life, right? This new perspective. And what happened there with, uh, you know, 
you uh, did you go back to flying? I went back to flying and I was the only person to go from stage four cancer to go back into an ejection seat aircraft. So a fighter type aircraft uh -huh. after that ever in the air force. So I was, I was very fortunate to do that. Um, why, yeah. did, why did that happen? Why did they allow you to do that? So, uh, so they were fighting that because even, even though my tumor markers had retreated and things were looking better, uh, I, you know, I just done seven months of chemo, my, my hair turned silver and fell out mostly. And, and so I, I, I didn't look like a fighter pilot anymore. And, uh, <laughs> what, what did you look like? I, I'd lost like 30 pounds and, and just, I'd, I look like I had cancer and, okay, uh, and, yeah. and so I committed myself. And you didn't have 30 pounds to lose. Right. Exactly. So it was all muscle so, and everything. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh and so I, I, I worked out really hard following chemo and I actually ran through chemo as well and forced myself to stay disciplined about that. And one of the things I took away from the the story with the little girl is that I was going to still, you know, to treat my life the same way, same level of discipline and, 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 and just commit myself to things. And so I worked out exceptionally hard. I went and took the air force physical fitness test and I got the perfect score on it, which only like 1% of the pilots get that are healthy. And so then I went back to the doctors who weren't going to let me fly. And I threw this piece of paper on their desk and I said, uh, I'm not flying, but I just aced your physical fitness test. And uh, I'm pretty sure I can go up and do stalls with students. And uh, they said, yeah, you got a point. We'll get you back up in the air. And then they allowed me to fly again. And so why aren't you flying? So then one of the things that I committed to was, uh, you know, through cancer, you talk about what you're going to do differently. And this is part of what I talk about in survivor's obligation. We all, and when you go to the chemo room, everyone talks about how they're going to be different on the other side of cancer. Cause first of all, everybody is very optimistic and they all talk about what happens when they get better and they're going to finally fulfill their life dream. Maybe their life dream is to, you know, reconnect with their daughter or it's to uh, go to the Super Bowl or, you know, fill in the blank. Everybody had some experiences that they just had never pursued. And now that they had this this scary, you know, cancer battle, they, they said they're going to hold themselves accountable to actually living the life they wanted to. A lot of those people didn't get that do chance. We all, do we all have that? Do and we and that was the whole that when that hits that they were all like that. Everybody said, I just want to be. I need to, I'm, I'm living a life that isn't the life that I should be living. I should be doing whatever, right? 100%. Everybody. Every single person that I talked to had something new that they were going to do. And, and maybe they didn't lament their, their life today, but they said, there's something I'm not doing that uh, I'm going to do if, when, when based, I get my second things chance. things that we didn't do or we are not doing in our life, are they all based in fear? I think so. I, I think, you know, there's a great quote that the dying have the most to teach us about life. And I think that that's true and that we could all probably agree with that because in those moments close to death, all of a sudden, as the noise of life goes away, all the things we thought were important, we have this clarity and what's exposed to us is what is the most important and what should have been important all along. And with extreme clarity, as like a light switch, all of a sudden you see this. I'll never forget that. Even very early on, I had this clarity about what I sh should have been doing differently and in a bit of resentment and regret that I even lived life um, a certain way before that. And so- What's the regret that you had? For me, the regret was around um, allowing other people's perceptions to determine the actions I took. And here's what I mean by that. I, I wanted to maintain a certain perception from, from other people. And so I wouldn't take chances. There were plenty of things I never tried in life because I was worried I'd fail. And I was a fighter pilot. I could coast on that brand and that perception for a long time. And I could sign autographs and, and do cool things. But as soon as my life was ending, all of a sudden I was saying, this is it. Like I had so many of the things I wanted to do and kind of the epiphany of this moment was not just that I was going to die soon, but that I was going to die period. Cause notionally that had been so far away and, and I never thought about it. And, and it forced me to reconcile with the fact that I, I, there were other chapters in my life I wanted to have. Flying was incredible. I loved every minute of it, but I didn't want it to be the book of my life. I wanted it to be a chapter. And so that was one of the commitments I made uh, to go pursue new things if I got better. So, you did. And so how did it, how did you get to the point where you, because the other thing is, I do think that we, as we get better and as we get back to 
our quote normal life, whatever that is, you know, maybe somebody went better, left the chemotherapy thing, they got better and they went back to just being a CPA. Right. Okay? Right. Or they worked the line in a factory again, you know, and they just did it, even though they were saying then that they wanted something different. Okay. Right. Because, because as soon as we get back to this sense of normalcy, okay, we, that fear or whatever was holding us back shows up again, right? Yeah. And now we have to sort of break through that, you know. Um, I ran into that when I was sort of 40 years old, all right? And the way I broke through it is somebody fired me. Okay? Yeah. So they did it for me, all right? And that worked out well for me. But it was a very, very painful transition. If I had to make the decision myself, I'm like you, I was coasting. Yep. You know, I was working, I was making money, I had title, I had brand, I had a reputation, you know, uh, I fit into society well, I met perceptions well, but then it was all gone, yep. <laughs> right? Now that led me to AA, which led me to Christ, all right, which led me into living the thing that I really wanted to do, which was to get back to s serving entrepreneurs and working with entrepreneurs and all that. But man, I wouldn't have gotten there without it. What was yours? I mean, what what got you to the point where you didn't just fall back into, I'm a fire puddle again, I'm flying again, I'm teaching again, I'm cool, everything's great. Marsha, we're back online, okay? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it was it was the fact that I had experienced the worst case scenario. And I had all these ideas of what the worst case scenario was in my head for life um, prior to cancer. And, and then I would experience what a true worst case scenario was. And all of a sudden, all of these fears, because you hit the nail on the head, it is it is about fear. All these fears that I had had previously, fear of failure, fear of what people would think about me, they paled in comparison to A, what I just experienced, and B, my desire to go pursue more chapters in life. And, and that had just been such a revelation to me. And I so desperately wanted this second chance. And God, if you give this to me, I'm not going to squander it and I'm going to make the best use of it. And of course, it was tempting to squander it. And it was it was tempting to fall back in my comfort zone and just be the pilot who beat cancer and, and coast on that again, because that was a new accolade uh, for me. And, and instead, I had to leave all that behind and go reinvent myself. But honestly, it was one of the easiest decisions I ever made. And, and here's a big switch I made in my life after having cancer. It's because I changed one little word in my outlook. I I didn't have to do these things. You know, I don't have to go be CEO of a company. I don't have to go be a fighter pilot. I don't have to go pursue American Ninja Warrior or any of these the things that I do in life. I don't put that pressure on myself. I don't feel anxious at the end of the day if I haven't done it. I don't have to do these things. But because I have this second chance, I get to. And literally that one little word has made all the difference. It's the opportunity to go after these things that I almost didn't have. And, and that transition has, has been the, the critical piece for me. So when I know that I get to, then I want to. Yeah. All right. But there was a, there was a point, and I think it's an important point. It was in the, it was in the book on, on what was the final moment where you made that decision. Oh, in the flying example? Yeah, when you weren't coasting, I can't, I, yeah. know I won't find it right away. But I think it was, it, it really was so poignant a moment. Yeah. I think if you could tell that story, you know, and the story here I'm looking for is how did you finally get to, right. I quit, right? Yeah. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to do something else. Go ahead. Exactly. Yeah, a great, great question. And so I committed to this, but I didn't really knew what that, know what that commitment meant in terms of, you know, what, what is my next chapter going to look like? How am I going to pursue something new? And, and when do I know it's time to do that? Yeah. And the those example. Are all the questions. Yep. That hold us back because exactly. I got to get all those questions answered and then I'll do it. Exactly. Okay? And we never get them all answered. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> and so I'm flying again. I'm back in the cockpit. I am flying upside down. I'm doing this routine maneuver that is very difficult for students to do, but an important one where we will go 10 feet behind another aircraft and that aircraft will do a barrel roll in front of us. And so they'll go upside down and I'll go upside down just like I am here in this picture. And I'll stay 10 feet behind that other plane as they're sitting in front of me. And I'll have to maintain that position. You can imagine how hard that is to not, not just fly in formation 10 feet away from another aircraft, but to do it as they're doing this barrel roll through the sky. And so 
Um, I'm doing that and I'm just happen to be upside down and I look up, which is down because I'm upside down <laughs> and I see the road that I have to drive home on. And wouldn't you know it, there's a big accident on the road and I'm looking at this and I see all these lights and I see ambulance and fire trucks and, and police cars. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, oh, it's going to take forever to get home today. And it dawns on in me. In the middle and, of this. In the middle. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going 500 miles an hour up down 10 feet away from another plane. And this all happens in an instant. Cause I can't stare at the ground. Cause I, you know, I, I, I can only take a quick glance as I'm continuing to maintain my position. But when I took that quick glance, I, I perceived the, the accident and the, and the, you know, traffic jam for miles and, uh, and the congestion. And then I had that thought that it's going to take forever to get home today. And my mind starts getting focused on the drive home and what I have to do that night. And I, and it just dawns on me that as I'm going 600 miles an hour upside down, 10 feet away from another plane, I am firmly planted in my comfort zone. And I had decided through cancer that my comfort zone was the enemy. And I needed to go find other things that made me uncomfortable and going into new chapters and, and growing. Growth is always, always, always on the other side of a comfort zone. And I just wasn't growing anymore. I looked cool. I mean, it's a cool video. It's a cool story. But it's, it's certainly not something to do for the rest of your life over and over again, because I wasn't, well, I wasn't growing because of it. And that is... That story had an, an immense impact on me. I can't stop thinking about it because uh, if you talk to my friends, they would say, you know, Charlie's a comfort guy. You know, it's easy for me to fall into this or live off of this, maybe a reputation or the comfort that I'm in, you know, the wealth that I've accumulated, the, the, um, the accolades that I have, have had achieved, whatever. And I'm feeling like, okay, and I'm at this age, like it's, I'm allowed now to actually retreat to this comfort zone. I mean, it's socially acceptable now. Okay. Yep. But I can't seem to get a piece about it. All right. Which is why I do things like this and have conversations like with guys like you. Okay. And, you know, when you outline this thing about coasting, and then when you told that story is you had gotten so good at what you were doing that you could be in one of the most difficult maneuvers in a fighter jet and, and be, and look and go, Oh my God, getting home is just going to be a bear, you know, and that traffic or whatever it was, I went, Oh my God. I said, that's me. That's me. You know, <laughs> what am I going to do here? You know? Uh, so that was such, it had such an impact on me. I just wanted to share that with you. And so what did you do? What did you do after you landed then? I made the commitment. And, and so I did every, what I do every time when I'm getting ready to start another chapter. I call people who are in that chapter because one thing I know for sure, I, I don't want to be the next Zuckerberg. I don't want to map this out on my own. I don't want to chart my own course. I don't believe there's really any new ideas under the sun. And I'd much rather learn from mentors and people that I trust mm -hmm. that are down that path. So I called some people that are already transitioned into business and talked about you know, what, what would my path look like? They said, go to business school. I started applying to all the big business schools and, uh, and then we're off, uh, with that journey. And then afterburner comes up and afterburner. And then I reached back out to, to afterburner and, uh, got a role as a consultant. And I started on about the 2012 timeframe as its consultant, as I was doing business school. So I'm learning and at the same time, applying it, um, with the customers that I'm working with. And, uh, and then in 2000, how big was Afterburner when you joined them? So we were about 15 people full time in our office, but we uh -huh. have an office in Australia as well. And then we have 70 consultants that are around the globe. So the 15 okay. person team is, is supporting the, uh, the, the and consultant. You were one of the 70 running around the globe. Kind yep, of that, exactly. Right? I was one of both. So I lived at our headquarters and, uh, and, and one of the 15, you know, the, the corporate leaders, but then also one of the 70 consultants that, that ran around the country and the globe. headquarters uh, in Atlanta? Yes, it is. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. And you were at the time living in San Antonio? I was for the first two years from 12 to 14. And then in 14, I moved to uh, Atlanta. How did you begin? Why did you, how did, you know, of all of these high powered, high achieving, high achieving men and women that you were, that you were working with, it said you, you said that you became president in two years. How did that happen? Was it because no one else wanted to be president? And so, so you became president and what happened? 
No, it was competitive. It was, you know, there's certainly others that wanted it. I would say, you know, of course, the, every, you know, just as anybody who's, who's afforded it, um, some success, it's, it's luck timing and positive impact mm -hmm. in terms of what made me different. I would say I, I was coming out of this period where, uh, I, I mean, honestly, it was such a blessing to have had cancer. I always say that I would never go through it again for a million dollars, but I wouldn't give up the experience for a hundred million dollars because I, I was just so transformed and so on fire and so ready to take on anything afterwards that it was, I don't want to say easy, but it, it was fell in line with my, you know, just what I loved in life. Once again, I didn't have to do it. I didn't, I didn't bemoan work. I, I loved doing this. I, it was something I got to do. And, uh, and, and that's just made the difference since then. So because of this experience that you had with cancer, then no one else had a chance to be president except you because you were, you were going to get it. You really wanted it. I was the lucky guy who had cancer and, and, and I wanted it, but at the same time, I loved it. And, uh, and I got to do this and it what was, makes, what makes for a good fighter pilot. And now that you're in fact, not just president, but you're CEO now too. Right. Right. Yeah. So as you, as you look back, what makes, uh, what, what sort of skills make a good fighter pilot and what skills make for a good CEO? So I would say that it's, it's a pretty similar track. Okay. It, and so it's going to change depending on your stage of, uh, your maturity. So initially when you're a wingman, you're the best fighter pilots have the strong technical skills. You have the strong, um, hand eye coordination and, and you completely hone your abilities. It's called stick and rudder skills in mm -hmm. the aircraft to fly and always be dependable and always uh, never be the limiting factor for a mission. And, and if you can do that, you're going to be an incredible wingman and you're going to be an incredible individual contributor. And if you think about that, you're, you're, you're focusing yourself along a technical path. Right. Same thing in business. Same thing as a consultant. I initially had to be the best consultant. I had to sell the most. I had to deliver the most value for my customers. I had to learn what competitors did. And so I, I became a fighter pilot, you know, the best fighter pilot I could be. Uh, and that was within the two that years that you were a consultant for Afterburner. You exactly. were going to learn all of those stick and rudder skills, if you will. Right. hundred okay. percent. All right. And then the critical transition to make after that, and I think it's analogous to, to everything in life as a fighter pilot, you have to go from honing your skills in the cockpit to being able to scale that to other people, like we talked about earlier, but not just from a stick and rudder capability as part of it, being a good instructor to talk about things organizationally and holistically and why what we do in our mission in the F-15 is so important and what it connects to, to the Navy SEALs on the ground. And, and here's how it all comes together. And it was the same thing as a CEO. All of a sudden, you know, I couldn't just continue honing my own individual abilities. I had to unlock those abilities and others and connect that to customer impact and someone else's career path. And, and so you go from being a technician to a generalist and, and having to have an ex a high level of EQ and not just IQ in order to be successful. And so it's a, it's a new muscle to flex when you go into that leadership role. And it's a tough transition for a lot of people, but it's a, but it's an, another really important well, when you're one. Dealing with, when you're dealing with the guys that you're dealing with in this uh, afterburner, yep. and uh, I don't want to put you in a difficult position here, but you know, I, it seems to me that uh, you're dealing with people who pride themselves on their technical skills. Right. That's how they got to be the best of the best. All right. If I'm in special forces – if I'm in a Navy SEAL, if I'm name it, it doesn't matter. I'm the best of the best at combat, okay, and what I do and the type of combat that I'm involved in, you know, or fighter pilot, right? So it's uh, – what pers it, it must be difficult for – if that's where I spent my life to then say, now I'm going to move to where I am a generalist. You know? hundred percent. Yeah, it's the so most challenging transition they make and not all of them make it well. Um, it's, so it's, some of it's, them it's, are just lifetime consultants, right? That's what they'll do. And, and they continue pursuing to go back to what we talked about earlier, that success mountain, right? They never really transition to that significance mountain and they continue pursuing their own success, their own, you know, their own technical skills in, in what we've found. Here's the analogy I give to them. I'll say, you're not ready because you, the transition you have to make in your head is it's no longer all about you. It's about it's all about the customer impact for your entire life. You've been Luke Skywalker on stage. Everyone poured all their investment into you and making you incredible. And then you carried out the mission and it was all about you. 
now you're Yoda. You're unlocking these, you know, these opportunities with all these other people and you have to teach them how to do these things. Or to use another example from, from recent days, I'll That's say. That's a cool example, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, and it's hard to do. Nobody, I mean, who wants to be the little tiny green guy in the background <laughs> leading these things? To, to Luke Skywalkers of the world, they think, I don't know if I'm really wanting, and that's, if they're being honest, they, they'll they say, I love the limelight. I love the spotlight. I don't want to stop doing that. And I'll say, fine, go back and be a fighter pilot or you know, just be a speaker or something. Yeah. Um, but at some point, you you got to figure out how to go off the ego mountain and go on to the significance mountain uh, instead. So when you say, so, so the success versus significance for you, success is all about me and my performance. And significance is all about others and their performance. Hundred percent, and and you know the word the uh, vocabulary is not perfect. I've never heard it characterized that way. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, and and success, and and I think it's the the other thing to add there is that come down to is what's your legacy? Exactly, and and the success mountain is not a bad one to be on. I, I have to add there, it's not it's not a race to get to significance because there. I mean, I don't want to tell, I don't want your young listeners to be thinking I'm going to go right to significance. Not that you can't be significant, but you do have to create some success for yourself first to have something to give to the rest of the world. So you got to invest in yourself. You have, have to invest credibility that people exactly. want to receive what you have, right? One hundred percent. Yeah. So so that's not a bad. You can't you can't skip the mountain. You can't go right to significance. So you have to build that, but don't get stuck on that mountain. Don't get stuck on pursuits of success because you will ultimately find them unfulfilling as successful as you'll be. And we all know that 70, 80 year old, you know, business leader who's still getting drunk at the bars and still chasing women and still pursuing success in their own and their own ego building things. And we all have a little bit of sorrow for them. And because we know that they're missing out on this other opportunity, maybe we don't articulate it as a significance, but we know that they could do so much more instead of these, these fruitless pursuits that they've gotten stuck with. But do we all, you know, one of the things I, I often wonder, though, we all have different purposes in life. God made us for a purpose, if you will. You know, what, what is, some people are just that great, like that doctor at MD Anderson, yeah, right, that you have. He's like top of the top as far as success goes. You know, in other words, he is a phenomenal technician, all mm -hmm. right? He probably had opportunities to move up into hospital administration and other kind of, and he's like, no, I'm really great, great, great at this. I don't know that that's, I look at that and I go, that's, that is his path. You know, that's- 100%. Cool yeah. But, you know, so not everybody has that next step, but there's a fear in moving sometimes from that path for those that do have that next step. And what I think that you're saying is break through the fear. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I would say don't conflate significance with title, right? So that, that doctor is, is uh, significant, but maybe not from a hospital administration perspective. Yeah. That doctor is extremely active in cancer forums. And he helps to ease the fear of people who are just getting this because he tells them the story of the many others who've been there before them. And, mm -hmm. and he leans in in other ways that you know, that maybe a title doesn't attach itself to, but he's, he's found ways to translate his success into significance and impact for others. Yeah. Great. One of the things I was going to ask you was what made it motivated you in the past and what motivates you now? And, you know, uh, part of the answer you gave me was I used to have to, and now I get to, right. <laughs> you know, but I noticed in your book, you talk about these things like, going 75, doing a free drive, free, free dive for 75 feet, yeah. doing the, um, the, uh, what is it? The Ninja Warrior, what is, which is the Ninja American Warrior? Ninja Warrior American the TV Ninja show, Warrior yeah. thing, <laughs> running a, uh, doing the triathlon that you did and all that is, it seemed to me, it sounded like, man, it seemed like everything's physical for this guy, you know? So what's motivating you? What's, what motivated you in the past and what motivated you in the, in the, in currently? You know, I kind of, if I, if I step back far enough, I say, looks like he's pretty much the same guy. So it's a great question. That's a really insightful one. The physical aspects are the easiest to see. And so that's why I talk about them in the book. That's why those are the, th I mean, those are the things that resonate the most. It's hard, it's harder to, to describe some of the mental transformations that we make. Um, but it's easy to see that I went and, and I went on a TV show and I wasn't afraid of failure on American Ninja Warrior, or I, I signed up for an Ironman triathlon without doing an, a marathon or a triathlon ever in my life before that. So those are very tangible, easy to understand examples. 
less easy to understand examples that are just taking place within me are the, those those efforts to um, to reduce my my focus on myself and to 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 you know every single day find things to be grateful for start my day with gratitude um, find something to be afraid of and then conquer that fear on a daily basis knowing that the that my comfort zone is my enemy the 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 best parts of my life are on the other side of my comfort zone and I have to seek discomfort as crazy as that sounds, um, whether that's in working out, which is a very tangible way, an easy way to understand it, or it's discomfort through leading teams or going to, to take on new roles. And, and, you know, those are just as uncomfortable for me, but less of a, a good story uh, to tell in front of a crowd. And, and, and then through my family and I, you know, in, in investing in my family and, and, uh, and making that, an effort as well. So the, the Ironmans and those things are, are easy to watch and they're fun, but the real journey is taking place outside of that. And the pre-cancer Joel would have kept coasting in all those things as well. I would have woken up, my kids would have graduated high school and I would have said, I missed it. And I, I wouldn't have been consciously investing in, in all these things. I just know how the old me would have been. And I love that, that coasting is so strong. And then to find something, I wake up every day, find something to be afraid of. Yeah. Okay. And then conquer it. That's brilliant. So in short, what would you, could you summarize for us? You wrote the book, you took the time to do this, a survivor's obligation. What mm -hmm. is the survivor's obligation? The what survivor's ob obligation at first glance seems like it's a story about me or about my co-author, Chris Strickland, but it's really not intended to be that way. Uh, we tell very dramatic stories of surviving near-death experiences, mine, a cancer battle, his, a, a plane crash, and they're, they're exciting. And, and, you know, I think that's what makes them good reading material because it's, it's, it, it almost reads like a movie and are these experiences that we've had. Man, but I that want to tell you, yours gave me bad dreams all night. Okay. I just <laughs> want to tell you that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's, it's, it's a compelling story. I can't relate I wanna, to his plane crash thing because, you know. That's a yeah. plan. That's a pilot thing. Yours, that was on the ground for me, baby. <laughs> yeah. It, and I think that re that resonates with everyone, just this fear of cancer and fear of mortality. And, but more importantly, fear of living an unfilled life, unfulfilled life. There's a great quote that uh, the definition of hell is the following. The last day on earth, uh, the person you became meets the person you could have become and you see the life that you could have led and the, the impact you could have had for the kingdom and, and just, you know, forget about accolades, forget about titles or any of those other things we would associate with success, but yeah. the, the impact and the significance you could have had. And so the survivor's obligation is about every person reading it. And the whole, the whole story is to say, you're a survivor as well. And when I say that, when I tell people you're a survivor, immediately something comes into their mind. I don't, we don't have to talk about it, but right. in their head, they think about, you know, the divorce they went through. Uh, they'll think about their parents getting some terrible situation, right? Or health, it could have been a health care, health scare, but yeah. it doesn't have to be, right? Are you with me? Exactly. Right. And I want them to remember that and remember that they survived it and remember that not, not everybody does survive that sort of thing. Okay. And so, that the, so the question really is, is then, okay, knowing that I've survived something, you're telling me I now have an obligation. Exactly what right. Is that obligation? The obligation is to live your life in honor of those people that didn't get that second chance and would have given anything to live the life that you're leading right now. Your existence. I don't care what's going on in your life. You're still living the storybook existence that somebody else would have given anything to have. And when we flip the script and we see things that way, that we have, we are all survivors. We are all on the other side of some travail that we have an obligation to live differently, certainly to our previous selves and also to the other people who didn't get this second chance and to commit and determine what is that obligation? What does that look like? What is, how do we make sure that we don't meet our, you know, the person we could have become someday and, and see the, the, the things we missed out on in life. And uh, that's the challenge uh, that I, that I put to, to everyone else. So in this, the way you describe that, it sounds like those people that were in chemo with you that uh, didn't make it, that you I had think a relationship that. with, you talked to and all this. And then one day they got the word, it ain't working, you ain't going to make right. it. And I think about because them. Because you're living for them is what you're saying. Yep. 
I think about them every, you know, when I had to make my transition out of the military and it would have been much easier to stay in. And I, it was scary. And, you know, I, I, of course, it's more comfortable to stay in and continue coasting on the accolades. But I would think well, about them said, looking at five me. years away from getting full pension. Yeah, full pension. I, I mean, for all practical purposes, and I should have stayed with it um, just mm -hmm. to get that alone. And of right. course, it's made a much bigger difference than pen, than a military like pension. Five years sounded like what to you? It, it sounded like letting down those those people. It sounded like the commitment that I had made in that room and how we all said our lives were going to be different. They fought just as hard to have this second chance and they didn't get it, but I did. And uh, and I had to hold myself accountable. If the opposite the of that side of it is you didn't know you had five years. And I didn't know I had five years. And, yeah, and the other that side makes of that a big is, difference too, is it says, okay, so I'm, my goal is going to be to reach full retirement yeah. and I might only make it two years. Does that mean I failed? No, I didn't fail because I didn't make full retirement. I failed because I didn't do the thing I should have done waiting exactly. for full retirement, right? Exactly right. <laughs> yep. And we don't know when that chance is going to be over. And that's, that's the message that everyone should take away from it as well, that, that we don't have to, we get to. But figure out what you get to do and then commit to that and to commit to how tough it's going to be and the fears you're going to have. And and the journey will be worth it. I've never talked to anybody who's made that leap and was disappointed on the other side. Well, I think that we should end it with that. <laughs> Mind if I share one more closing thought on the conversation I had with that little girl, that story I told you earlier, because I think this I is would love that. I would love that. I welcome it. Go ahead. So I've, I haven't never shared this on a public forum in a, in a podcast or anything like that before. It didn't make the book because it didn't happen by the time the book occurred. But I, I think this is why these types of conversations are so powerful, so important. And I think this is also how God continues to weave this into his impact into, into our lives. So I've told that story about the little girl many times, wrote it in the book and talked about it in podcasts like this about... Mm, 2019 timeframe, uh, I get a message on LinkedIn of all places. And it's, uh, it says, dear Joel in 2010, I was walking into MD Anderson with my little girl and <laughs> oh, she, no, she, no way. Yeah. No way. Go ahead. She had a bald head. She had a surgical mask on and she was about nine years old and she had beautiful blue eyes. And he said, and she was afraid uh, on that day. And he said, but she wasn't afraid four years later when she went home to be with God. And he said, uh, he, she taught us how to live and she taught us how to die. And today I live for her. And uh, he's, a, he's a pastor down in Houston. And uh, that was that was his story that he shared with me, and we worked it out and that that was his daughter. And that story is the ex exemplifies the survivor's obligation. Exactly right. And so it all came together. I mean, almost not. If you watch that in a movie, you'd say it's unbelievable, um, and yet it played out that way. And I think that's those are the, those are the fingerprints that God has on our lives if we're paying attention. You, as you said earlier, I think that was such a great point you made that if I wouldn't have been paying attention in that moment, and there's just a little girl looking at me, I didn't have to get this this you know transformative moment. It was about it was about listening for those though, and that, and that God does answer our prayers, um, not always in the way we want them to be, but always in the way we need them to be. And uh, and that was powerful for me. And so continuing to share these stories is powerful as well. People need to hear that. People need to have this reinforced. They're not going through this alone. And that uh, we all are on the other side of something that we survived. Thanks for taking the time to do this with me. This has been, uh, it's funny. I, I, I thought I was just going to read a couple of pages of your book to uh, just kind of get a couple of ideas, but I couldn't put it down. You know, I think that your story is so compelling and that you tell it so well. And by the way, you're a very good writer. Thank you. You are. You're a very good writer. So clear, so concise, you know, just really so well done. So congratulations on the book. And uh, I know that I'll be sharing it with other people because it's uh, it, it really has a powerful message. You know, your story is wonderful. And I'll never forget that little girl. I'll never forget it. And now I really will never forget that little girl. You know how this... How God kind of just tied the two ends together. And yeah. here we are. So thanks, Joel. Well, I'm just going to close this out and then I'll uh, get back to you and we'll say goodbye. Okay. Sounds great, Charlie. Thanks for your time. Wow. That's a heck of a story. Isn't that amazing? What about, but what about you? 
That's what I want to know. What about you? You know, do you wake up worried about what you have to do or are you thinking about what you get to do? Do you wake up like Joel and think about, I got to find something that I'm afraid of and then I need to conquer it because that on the other side of that is where the fulfillment in it is where fulfillment is. And that's the really the achievement of God's plan for your life. So if you'd like to hear more of these interviews, sign up at paparelli.com. Just give me your email and uh, we will be all set and you'll never miss one. Thanks for coming.